option in, in Zoom views to ask questions. What we found is that <clears throat> we end up having a lot of side conversations and it gets very difficult for um, the presenter or the, the, um, the person running the meeting to, to work out what actual questions want to be asked. So what we've got is a separate little um, website uh, called Slido. And if you click on that link or type that link in, it's actually in the, uh, I think it's in the meeting invitation that you would have received to get into this Zoom meeting. Uh, or if you go back to our website, space.asm.au, there's a hyperlink there. That will take you to Slido. And what you can then do is ask your question. <clears throat> and the good thing about that, anyone can ask a question. And if, if you see another question that somebody else has asked and you think that's a really good question, you can vote it. So if we get a, a question that 10 people have voted up, it goes to the top of the list. So it's a nice way of sort of, um, you know, getting a bit of an interactive feel going without having 17 different people talking at the same time, if you know what I mean. So um, yeah, take your time, go, go and have a look at that Slido uh, uh, page. And once again, if you want to go ahead and type that string in, you can go ahead and do that if you like. All right, so uh, just a bit of touch base on the Space Association uh, business. Uh, we, as we've said in the last several months, we were supposed to have an AGM back by the end of May, unable to do that due to Corona. So we still don't have a date for that. Um, we've got a, an opportunity, potential opportunity to have a face-to-face uh, -face or virtual meeting, but it looks like it's all getting a bit too hard. So we're probably just going to wait till we all actually get together um, to be able to meet. Uh, but we'll have an online presence for people that are members of the association and would like to participate and vote. Uh, we'll have that as part of the, um, of the AGM, the virtual AGM. So once again, to be decided. Um, now, we have been meeting, for those who have been around long enough, we were meeting at the, uh, the uh, Golden Gate Hotel down in South Melbourne. They love us. I just got this email the other day from the venue manager and he's basically every month we talk about whether we're going to be meeting this month and he contacts me and says, I'm sorry, we can't. So this is the last email from him. He's hoping that... Uh, well, at least until November 23rd at this stage, we won't be able to have any meetings. So fingers crossed, we might be able to have a December uh, end of year shindig in there or something like that. So unfortunately, the, this meeting, meeting, obviously the September meeting and October meetings are not going to happen. Maybe we'll get in on the, in November, I don't know. We'll see what happens with the, um, with the case, the case numbers and the government permissions for us to be able to, to meet. All right, so once again, just a reminder, the formula we do have our meetings is the fourth Monday of the month and uh, uh, the next meeting therefore will be the 26th of October. So next one after it'll be the 2nd of November. And once again, because of the fourth meeting of December would be in the middle of crazy time, we're probably gonna be meeting on the 14th of December at this stage. So um, keep an eye on your uh, social media and, and things like that and we'll let you know. Um, for those who, don't know this, the association is a completely volunteer organization. We do everything based on uh, people's uh, efforts and also a little bit of income from our membership. Um, and uh, we have quite a good number of members. We do thank you um, for becoming members and staying members. And uh, if you'd like to become a member yourself, just go to that website and uh, follow the bouncing ball and uh, we'd be happy to have you. All right, so just a little bit of uh, space, Australian space news. Are we recording yet? Oh, yes, we are. Fantastic. So uh, as I had on that first slide there, uh, Australia's first private space rocket blast off is a, is a headline. So um, the first commercial space cable rocket blasted off from Kundiba test range in South Australia's far west coast on Friday the 18th. It was the first commercial uh, space rocket uh, launch in Australia. Um, it aimed to reach 85 kilometres, which would be the highest of any commercial rocket uh, from Australian soil. And it was the second attempt. Uh, it's a 3.4 metre long rocket, 34 kilograms, and they had a misfire in the first one on Tuesday. And then they had a second, a second launch uh, uh, about an hour later. Uh, now, the last one I heard they were doing a recovery effort, so I don't know what the situation is there about where that uh, rocket might have fallen. Um, I do have a little bit of video. Hopefully it'll sort of run for you. There's no audio. Apologize for that.
So that was the first launch. And here we go for the second one. All right, so that was good. So we, we had uh, Lloyd Damp from uh, Southern Launch uh, talk with us a couple of meetings ago. So he was talking about his upcoming campaign. So things are moving. I mean, it's no, it's no Kennedy Space Center at this stage, but at least it's something happening and um, it's nice to see. All right, so um, I'm gonna have a quick look at the US uh, election and the space policy. Once again, I do apologise, this might skip over a lot of details, it might have some details wrong. I've tried to sort of glean from very different, many different sources as much as I can and trying to distill it down to a, a succinct um, understanding as far as I've got of what they're proposing or what they've done. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll give that a go. So obviously we've got the two candidates. Uh, the, the presidential candidate obviously is uh, Donald Trump. He's 74 years old doesn't pay taxes. Uh, well, he, well, he paid $700 last year, apparently. So well done. Um, so he's a political, he was a Republican, and then he was a Democrat, then he was a reform, then he was an independent, now he's a Democrat. So I'll let you make your own decision about all that. So he, um, he assumed office in January 2017. The Vice President, uh, Mike Pence, 61 years of age, he's been a Republican, but he was a Democrat before 83. Uh, he was governor of Indiana, US House of Representatives, House Republican Congress. Uh, on the Democrat side, we've got Joe Biden. He's 77 years of age. He's been a Democrat the whole time, which is very consistent of him. Uh, he was vice president with uh, Barack Obama uh, between 09 and 2017. And he's a United States Senator from, Del Senator from Delaware. He's been there for since 1973. So a lot of experience. His running mate, uh, Camilla Harris, she's 55 from California. She's been a Democrat the whole time as well. And she was, she's a Senator. Uh, she was an Attorney General and a District Attorney of San Francisco. All right, so I guess the real way to start this is that um, Moon and Mars is not really a defining issue of, the, of a presidential election. It's not the hot topic issue, right? Um, it's something that is there, but it's not a, not really going to swing people either way. It may, it may do differently for people like us, space nerds, et cetera, but for the average Joe person, Joe Blow, in, uh, who's able to vote, they probably wouldn't be swung either way uh, by the space policy. Um, so obviously Joe Biden's been a senator for a long time. Um, and a lot of times only the senators, only politicians really dig into the, um, to NASA if they've got contractor facilities in their district. So he's in Delaware, they don't have it. So they're more with Amtrak and uh, other things instead of the SLS up there. Um, there's not really much of his involvement in space policy uh, as it's number two, although he did play um, a quite a good role in getting funding through Congress. So, uh, Since taking over as President Donald Trump, um, he's largely adopted the Obama space agenda. You probably wouldn't hear that from him, but that's really what has happened. He inherited, inherited a lot of things and kept a lot of things going, which is, which is good. Um, he has accelerated the plan, of course, uh, of, uh, of the Artemis program to return U.S. astronauts, including the first woman to the surface of the moon. Rather than 2028, he's now want, decided it wants to be within this uh, end before he's end of his second term if he gets re-elected. So, um, he's also begun an international push uh, uh, for the legal understanding of uh, what can be done on the moon because obviously the Outer Space Treaty prohibits a lot of things and he's trying to get it so that uh, it's a bit freer and they can do a few more things on, on the moon and, and in other parts of the uh, space as well. Um, uh, Joe Biden in the past has said, we, you know, the US should work more closely with China in space. Um, I guess there's different opinions about that and China's behavior over the last few years may, may have even changed his opinion. I'm not very really sure what his current thinking on that particular topic is. Um, 
So the biggest trend in, in space under Trump has been uh, the continuing the integration of private space partnerships. Obviously, this was started, actually, it was started back in w, George W. Bush and then continued with, um, with uh, Obama, and now he's picked, uh, Trump's picked that up and, and uh, kept it going. Uh, he's also championed, this is Donald Trump, championed Space Force, a new military service. Um, the idea being that it aggregates uh, space power under single command. Um, there's been a lot of stuff about uniforms and badges on sides of rockets, but what the actual definition and what the actual purpose and what the actual benefit is, it's a bit up to debate a bit. Um, yeah, as it says there, uh, yeah, how, how it goes ahead and procures products and services and hardware is is uh is something up in the air uh about how that's going to work um but it is very much a, a political posturing uh, uh position i guess from the from the government um so once again with all the things that are going on trade wars pandemics etc uh the space is not going to be a huge topic uh, in on inauguration day, but it's obviously going to be important for people like us anyway. So let's have a quick look at the Democrat side, what they've, uh, oh, sorry, the Republican side, the elephant. Um, so during uh, Trump's first year, he re-established, uh, or he released a national space strategy, emphasizing American leadership, uh, advancing space as a priority domain, commercial space capabilities, maintaining a lead in space exploration. Uh, he re-established the National Space Council, which had, uh, had uh, gone away and um, had uh, not been active since uh, 1993 under George Herbert Walker Bush's administration. And then in uh, December 2017, he signed the Space Policy Directive uh, for writing US-led integrated program with private sector partners for human return to the moon, Mars and beyond. And the directive uh, actually deletes the words from the 2010 National Space Policy, Obama's, set far-reaching exploration milestones by 2025, begin crewed missions beyond the moon, including sending humans to an astronaut by mid-30s, send humans to orbit Mars and return to the Earth. So that's all been stripped out. Um, in March of 2018, he uh, unveiled his first national space strategy emphasizing the need for dynamic and cooperative interplay with national security he signed space policy directive number two which eased uh, regulations on the private space industry endeavors space policy directive three in june 18 addressed issues regarding monitoring of objects in orbit providing information to spacecraft operators etc avoiding collisions and global debris 2019, March, uh, Pence instructed NASA to put astronauts on the lunar surface by 2024, once again, four years ahead of the previous plan. And in December 2019, the National Space National Defence Authorisation Act created the sixth branch of the armed forces, the Space Force, and its mission is to organise and train and equip Space Forces um, to protect the US and allied interests. So I thought we'd have a quick look at uh, the federal budget, space policies, sorry, space budgets uh, from 2013 to 2020. And this data is from Wikipedia and I'm, I assume it's correct, but what they've done is they've um, amortized all the, da all the numbers to be in 2020, 2014 dollars. So obviously looking at the percentage of gross domestic product in 2013 versus 2019, and then pushing that back the percentage, it then gives you a way of looking at the numbers year on year and how they compare. So under the Obama administration, 2013 to 16, you can see you know, it was bouncing around half a percent of the federal budget. Uh, Trump, uh, it's pretty much the same. In fact, slightly less in some cases. Um, uh, yeah, the percentage wise, obviously the numbers are bigger because obviously the, the, the economy gets bigger. So, um, so those, those are the interesting numbers there. Um, looking back a bit further, 62 to 72, uh, quite interesting. Look at the percentage of the federal budget there in 62 is 1.18, uh, 66, 
that was at the height of the Apollo program getting ready to hit the moon. And that was under Kennedy and Johnson. And then Nixon came in and he uh, basically started trimming it back after 69. Uh, well, in fact, it was trimming down in, in 69 as, as the program became to its maturity and, and obviously got, uh, got the first landing on the moon. So down to 1.48 in 72. That was when they started developing the shuttle. Uh, here's a percentage um, of the federal budget graph, which I think is quite interesting. You can see uh, in the uh, in 60s. What I've done here is I've overlaid the different administrations, the red being the Republicans and the blue being the, the Democrats. So you can kind of see where the where the Democrats and the Republicans sort of sit, they sort of bounce around each other. There's not a huge difference, obviously, in the 60s and the mid-60s there with the Apollo program in full flight. That really skewed the whole subject, a whole percentage significantly. And obviously with different things that are happening um, around the world and in, this, in, the, in the economy. But you can see an overall gradual downward trend, which is not what we want to see. Anyway. Um, I'll just have, let you have a quick look at this. This was a, a, a Trump advertisement that was put out uh, fairly recently. I hope you'll be able to hear this. This country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. Man is about to launch himself on a trip to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Man on the moon. Boy. We can see you coming down the ladder now. 38 year old American standing on the surface of the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That magnificent moment. They did the impossible because they knew that together there is absolutely nothing Americans can do. Now we are ready to begin the next great chapter of American space exploration. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. The vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first. Once more, we will launch intrepid souls blazing through the sky and soaring into the heavens. Once more, we will summon the American spirit to tame the next great American frontier. And once more, we will proudly lead humanity. And that's what it is. It's humanity beyond the earth and into those forbidden skies. But they will not be forbidden for long. With uh, guidance, navigation, and control. You're very important people. You have a great great contribution what you're doing has been incredible but it will be even more incredible far more incredible because we are giving you a platform the likes of which nobody has ever been given our nation of pioneers still yearns to conquer the unknown because we are americans in the future belongs totally to us. And we will make America great again. America great again. There you go. Are you convinced? Um, that ad was actually <laughs> pulled from online because it uh, breached some uh, NASA guidelines on the use of uh, NASA and and uh, some of the astronauts in in political advertisements. So, um, so NASA didn't even know about it. So it also Karen Einberg, who was married to Doug Hurley, complained about the video. Um, she, um, she sent out a tweet. <laughs> so she wasn't very happy. 
Um, yeah, so the video appeared to violate agency regulations by featuring footage of active astronauts or retired astronaut without the consent of the NASA logo. So there you go. There is actually, if you want to go and search, there's like a, a one hour YouTube uh, TV presentation, uh, Trump TV, I think it is. And it's a space policy discussion with Karen Nyberg, uh, not Karen Nyberg, um, uh, Janet Kavandi and uh, the uh, retired NASA uh, finance guy. If you want to, show, I can show you later on if you like. So, um, just to sort of round this off, I, I grabbed a couple of opinion pieces from different sources just to sort of give you an idea of what their protagonists or the supporters are saying. So, basically, this is from uh, Real Clear Politics. So for 30 years, the US has allowed its once dominant position to erode and a succession of, of political leaders in both parties are ignored. So, um, uh, because of these short-sighted policies, the United States engages in a second space race with China, which it's losing. So Donald apparently changed all that, changed this, and uh, so now he's the only candidate in this person's lifetime who spoke meaningfully about the need to return nationals to the moon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the, they keep coming back to this theme about this supposed space race with China. So under Trump, the uh, US uh, has a, st a strategy for winning the second space race and uh, defending critical satellites, et cetera, from attack. Uh, it's making it easier for investors, uh, innovators to reap the benefits, et cetera. St this is according to this opinion piece, stark change from the last few decades under Obama administration, NASA terminated the space shuttle without having a viable replacement. Well, I think a lot of us know that that's not quite the exact sequence of events, but anyway. Um, so that forced the US to, uh, to rely on the Russians, which as we know, they still use the Soyuz to get a lot of their astronauts up apart from the most recent um, SpaceX crewed mission. Under Obama, NASA turned inward and whatever funds were available uh, were used for terrestrial pursuits and global warming and robot missions, et cetera. So, uh, and this person saying if he wins, uh, it'll return to the same turgid place uh, in 2008 when Biden was tapped to be Barack Obama's running mate. His big idea was to have NASA conduct joint space missions with China. Uh, now, China, is, as we do know, has been barred from taking, taking partnership in the ISS by the Clinton administration. Um, they're saying that Obama was largely uninterested in the space program. There's possibly a little bit of truth in that, I think. Um, and he's saying that if he wins, uh, it'll be bad. It'll, spare, spell, it'll spell the end of what has become a very promising period, according to this opinion piece. And a vote for Biden would inevitably relegate the US to a second class status on earth. So let's have a quick look at the Democrat side. Um, so in 2020, in July, they uh, voiced their support for NASA and continued presence on the International Space Station crewed missions to the moon and Mars according to the draft of their policy, which was released on the 21st. It includes a paragraph on space policy describing how the administra an administration led by uh, Biden would handle space. Democrats continue to support national and are committed to continuing space exploration and discovery. We believe in continuing the spirit of discovery that has animated human space exploration, in addition to its scientific and medical research, technical innovation and educational mission that allows us to better understand our planet and its place in the universe, it continues. So it goes on specifically to support continued presence on the ISS uh, and work to support work support NASA's work to return Americans to the moon and go beyond Mars to the next step in the solar system. It doesn't explicitly reference the goal, the agency's goal of landing a crew by 2024. Uh, it doesn't really have a timeline on those. Um, it supports strengthening Earth observation missions. Um, and uh, John Hodgson, the professor emeritus of George, University, George Washington University, basically uh, feels like NASA, NASA supporters could, could be comforted by the Democratic platform. There's no suggestions, according to him, any changes in the NASA direction of programs, with the exception of a seemingly backing off of the unrealistic, and I think a lot of 
opinion is in support of this of the 2024 deadline. Um, Biden spoke briefly about uh, the recent SpaceX crew demo flight um, and basically underlined the fact that it, uh, 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 it basically the mission represents a culmination of work begun years ago and which Obama and he fought hard to ensure would become a reality as opposed to somebody else taking all the, all the credit. Um, they look forward to advancing the American commitment and pursuing space exploration, unlocking scientific discoveries. Uh, so basically they, they looked, he and Obama really oversaw a lot of the de major developments in the space sector, including the uh, commercial space flight. Um, Obama and Biden administration, they canceled their constellation program to return the uh, astronauts to the moon by 2020 after the commission that they'd set up concluded it couldn't be done without substantial spending increases. And um, <clears throat> basically they lacked the uh, manned ability to, um, uh, sorry, lacked a human spaceflight mission to the moon until December 2017 when Trump uh, re-established Artemis. Um, the Democratic platform uh, states that Democrats do support a crude return to the moon, as we spoke before. So here's an opinion piece on the other side. Uh, this is uh, written by Sean O'Keefe, former NASA administrator, and also John Grunsfeld, former NASA astronaut. And basically they're saying that um, they're harking back to the spirit of Apollo 11 and um, Americans face a choice about whether they want to renew that vision and continue to lead the world uh, beyond our own planet and drive uh, to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Basically, they believe he's, that Biden is the best leader uh, to take that forward. And he, they feel he's got like the JFK type uh, spirit of uh, leading, believing in NASA is the best of America and uh, helps the country get better. Um, he appreciates the current space efforts and supports what they're doing. Um, uh, I'm not going to read every line here, but I hope you can see what's on the screen. Um, talking a lot about climate change, of course. Uh, NASA, what, what he's saying is that because NASA routinely uh, engages with global partners, <coughs> Joe Biden is mindful it's an opportunity to exert active public di diplomacy on matters of common interest with other nations. Mm -hmm. And his, and his uh, diplomatic experience in the US Senate and White House, Biden appreciates a long-standing success with global collaboration helps complement our diplomatic engagements to reduce tensions and relationships to solve problems with other nations. And I think we I concur, to be honest, that's my per personal opinion. Um, so with all the different countries uh, uh, launching their own satellites, etc., uh, potential for conflict and collisions are, are rising and that, um, you know, what NASA's done uh, is uh, evolving and rapidly changing and um, Biden's important influence to forge bipartisan support for, for NASA and the vast potential for the burgeoning space industry. And that was proven under the Obama administration, Obama, Obama, Biden administration. And the recent SpaceX launch, obviously, um, as I mentioned before, it was, the strategy was devised under the George W. Bush administration and, and enabled by the policies of the Obama Biden administration. So if they believe he's uniquely qualified to lead the nation and the global partners in the next chapter of discovery. Um, I was, I'll probably skip over this because I don't really need this is talking about some other things. So just a summary at the end, I'm almost here, finish here guys. Um, so with the election coming up, uh, the pandemic and the damage it's done to the US economy, um, they're probably going to be the top issues. The general public probably won't go to the voting booth uh, with the future space policy in mind, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but uh, the government, uh, sorry, the commercial space industry are paying and global space industry are paying close attention to what uh, what's happening here in the midst of this. Um, they will face enormous decisions, as we probably no doubt, obviously with the new Space Force and the longer term plans of the ISS. Obviously, it's 
ISS is still up there and, and drawing a lot of funds from NASA and there's been a lot of discussion about whether they could kill off that and use those funds for other things. Obviously the SLS rocket, the big Senate launch system rocket, the project, the moon and Mars, the human landing systems, the gateway, etc. Big, big items, ticket items. And um, these decisions are going to be uh, involving lots and lots of money and lots and lots of government uh, activity and jobs, etc. So lots of development to go on. Um, this is probably pretty obvious to many people, but space policy experts really have stressed for a long time that it's tough for NASA to stay on target uh, toward long-term exploration goals, given how often presidents and Congress change their mind and the country's direction. So we've had Trump cancelled uh, uh, Obama's plans for crewed mission to capture an asteroid. Obama nullified the constellation program under W. Bush. And the Artemis moon landing program is significant acceleration uh, to go um, to 2024 as opposed to 2028. Um, and uh, I think there's a bit of stress out there going on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the current NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, has stressed that the agency is taking safety into account while tackling these large projects, but the accelerated pace is a challenge and some officials have, have said we're running really fast. Um, it's uncomfortable for many of us, but we're excited about it. So, Ooh, okay. so let's hope that doesn't turn into something uh, nasty. So just to finish off on this area, uh, obviously the the election is coming up in November, so an astronaut, uh, Kate Rubens, is going up uh, shortly. And on Friday, she said she's going to be actually voting from space, doing an absentee vote. Um, so it's going to go up in mid-October. Uh, and so apparently there is a, an ability, because most of the astronauts live in Texas, the Texas law does allow them to vote from space. And they send a secure electronic ballot to the astronauts and they, uh, they send back their vote. Um, so she joined back in 2009 and had her first flight in 2016. And um, good luck to her. Now, to, tap, to, to top it all off, uh, on the day before election day, NASA's reported the national is heading to the Earth. <laughs> so if you think it's going to be a disaster, well, you might be in for a really big one. However, they did say it's less than 1% chance that uh, it'll hit the earth. So we can breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief there, hopefully. All right, that's it for me. I hope I didn't skip three, through things too fast. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully we have got, uh, we've got Josh Keegan on the line. Uh, are you there, Josh? And uh, I didn't see any questions come through. Maybe we'll have the questions later, later on. Um, yeah, I can't hear anybody. Mike, all good? Hello. You're muted, Mike. Well, so I just hand straight over to Josh, Mike. Josh, do you want to take over now? I can't hear you. <laughs> how, how often do we hear that on Zoom? I can't hear you. Turn your microphone on, turn them off. Um, somebody asked about the link in, in to ask questions. It's in the Zoom chat, uh, the Slido. So if you go to the chat, you can see the link there. Um, all right. so. Uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Josh Keegan. Uh, Josh, I'll let you introduce yourself because I actually had a couple of slides to introduce you, but I've skipped off them. So um, hopefully you can pick up and explain your background and, and what you're doing and, and give us uh, an overview. Now, the whole screen's blank at this stage. So I'm not sure that's me or you or what's happened. Oh, okay. Josh, I can't hear you, mate. 
Yeah, we can't hear you, Josh. And are you going to share a screen or something? Yeah, I was going to share a screen. Um, I'm, uh, okay, can, you, can anyone hear me at all? I've got you, yes. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay. Oh, oh there we go. Hello. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> Greetings to everyone. Hello. Um, can everyone see me as well? Uh, I've got a video. I've got a video running here as well. All we've got is a still image of you in the main okay, area. Okay, that's that's probably the wrong one of me. It needs to be the other one. There's two of me in here. One was for the audio because I remember how we tested this and I could hear you guys. There's a second one of me, where I've got the full video and everything running. I can't see that. So when you hit share, when you hit share, you've got to select the. The screen yeah, there the I am screen. now. I'm actually com I'm coming through. So I've got, I've got you sitting at your desk at the moment. I haven't got a desk. Ah, desk. excellent. Yep. Hello, desk. Fantastic. Oh, there's, no, there's technology when it works. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Uh, awesome. All right. Um, so, yeah, so what I do is I thought I'd um, introduce myself, um, start out a little bit. Um, yeah, I do have one or two slides about myself. So, unfortunately, everybody, uh, this is probably the moment you want to tune out <laughs> um, because it's going to be all about me. Uh, just briefly, I, I won't keep you, everyone uh, too long. So um, just in case anyone hadn't noticed yet, my name is Josh Keegan and I host a, um, I have a YouTube channel called The Space Down Under. Um, the, the question that would immediately spring to everyone's mind would be, well, well, why? Why do you have a YouTube channel? Well, I've always been fascinated by the space industry, but uh, none more so when I was around about seven years old. So when the very first space shuttle was launched, that's when I became really, really interested. As a kid in Australia, like everyone else, I watched very grainy footage as NASA launched what was essentially something that looked like an aircraft into space. Like, that was ridiculous. It was from this moment on, I was hooked and also disappointed to find out that my only path to space was to become a US citizen. Over the years, disappointments did continue from that point as I managed to find out I was short-sighted, colorblind, and altogether too tall with 193 centimeters because I wouldn't fit in the cockpit of many of the training aircraft to actually get my qualifications. So my dream had to be put aside and I found myself waiting for the day when the average person could eventually fly to space. So I pursued a very different path and I've been in business for 20 plus years. I've been a CEO, I've been an entrepreneur, I've done many things over the course of my career. Uh, so fast forward to mid 2018 and I found myself in the United States and thanks to my very patient wife, I was able to indulge my passions for space. So of course, naturally, I visited SpaceX. I also went to the California Science Center where I was actually able to get up close and personal with the space shuttle, the space shuttle Endeavour. So this visit suddenly fueled my original passion for space and I had to do something about it. But, what I, but I wanted to make it about Australia. I mean, Australia. We as Australians, we've had a long and wonderful history in the space industry. For me, it was like, why isn't there someone talking about it? So I looked, and after a long and disappointing search, I decided that I'd have to do it, the YouTube bit. I found the SAA podcast, but I realized I would have to create a YouTube channel to tell our amazing story and our history, and hopefully meet some really interesting people along the way. The Space Down Under is all about highlighting our wonderful and very well-established Australian space industry. So far, I've met some of the biggest names in the industry and I hope to continue the journey to meet many, many more. So one of the people I managed to meet was Nick Green. He's the CEO of PFI Aerospace and is one such person who is actually looking to change the industry. Taking the, he's looking to take the complexity out of rocket engines and make them accessible to absolutely everyone. So I managed to catch up with Nick earlier this month for a special SAA edition of The Space Down Under. So I'm talking today for Nick Green from PFI Aerospace and Nick is going to be telling you all about what it is he is now doing. We've met previously, uh, for those of you who are playing at home, um, and Nick and I have actually um, spoken uh, over a year ago now. And so I thought it would be appropriate to actually catch up with Nick. So Nick, what is it you are up to now? I understand you've got, right, a, new you've got a new title. 
I do. So last time we talked, it was yep. general manager of defence and aerospace special projects. Yeah. For the lot. Now it's just CEO of PFI Aerospace. Oh wow. Okay. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, PFI has started a new company. Yeah. Which is called PFI Aerospace. Yeah. And its primary role is that like a arrowhead into industries. PFI is too cumbersome to take into. So yeah. Defence, aerospace, space industry globally. Wow. We can be a lot more agile where PFI can't. Right. So does that still mean you manufacture things here in Australia, obviously on the shop floor that, that we've, what I've um, seen before? Yeah, so PFI Aerospace will always be using PFI core yes. as its manufacturer. Oh, okay. We're not planning to have machines. We might have advanced machines like 3D metal printers, that sort of thing, but we're not, we're not going to have the vast manufacturing behemoth that is... <laughs> PFI, it's not worth setting it up twice. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So anything that PFI core can do day to day, they'll be doing. If we yeah. have to do something fancy that isn't really cost that PFI, we'll be doing it ourselves or reach, reaching out to other people. Oh, so, right. Reaching out to other people like who? Subcontractors. Oh, right. right. So PFI technically gets what's classified as first one refusal. Yeah. So if, you know, if they decide, no, it's not really in our warehouse, but we need someone, we'll find someone. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, and so, what do you have going on at the moment that's um, related to space? Um, what's, uh, what do you have in the works that obviously you can publicly talk about? Um, <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff you told me off camera that was really awesome. Um, yeah, it's so you watch this space. Yeah, watch, watch it. Uh, always. All right, so, but I mean, what, um, last time we met up, you showed me you, the, um, the rocket engine that could be fired on school grounds as a yep. technology demonstrator and all that sort of stuff. And then shortly thereafter, um, the, he also showed me the um, uh, the suitcase rocket engine, which actually goes by the name of Haley? Haley. Haley. Right, Haley. Haley. Hybrid All Inclusive Learning Initiative. Hybrid All Inclusive Learning Initiative. H right. A I L I. Oh, okay, excellent. So what's happened since last time we met? Well, on your last bit of footage, you yep. obviously saw Amber, which is sitting over in the corner over there. She's yep. the larger motor, which we've fired a number of times in quite a few different schools. Still functioning, still good as ever. Yep. Um, the footage you got of Haley, which was the small motor being, quite frankly, put together on the end of a desk. Yeah, it was. Um, She's now fully operational. We've produced 15 of them so far. Yep. We're about to start a production run of about 50 more. Oh, wow. Um, that should be happening within the next two months. So by January next year, we have a number of contracts being worked out through Take Queensland and a number of different schools to run this out a lot more. Oh, so, wow. Excellent. So those 50 motors should be operational in various aspects of society next year. Oh, excellent. Uh, it's on everyone's mind, and um, so it'll be on um, my mind as well. But has COVID-19 impacted anything you've been doing? Well, it stopped us. Sorry, it yeah. just stopped us for two months. So mid-March through to April, we pretty much didn't do anything. Just yes. scramble on deck, you know, try and keep PFI operational. All right, yeah. Uh, so so PFI Aerospace was still going, except that you had to dedicate all the resources and yourself into actually taking care of PFI manufacturing. Yeah, so technically PFI yep. Aerospace didn't exist at that time. Okay, yeah. Um, but part of the fact that Queensland has come through this fairly well. Yes. Um, we felt confident that starting a company was the right step in the right time. Yep. So we've done that since then and we've only expanded since. We've put on four new people total. All right. We're planning to put on two more shortly if we can find the right skill sets. Um, and growing that further to working directly with North Carolina. Oh, right. Some areas I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Um, so, so you actually have a contract with, uh, as we said in the previous video, you've got a contract with Northern Drum, and what does that mean exactly for PFI Aerospace? Yeah, so the accurate phrasing, yep. we have a global supplier number, yep. Northrop Grumman, and we have an MOU to work towards some um, more advanced space research and development programs. So oh, the wow. contract we're working towards, yep. so the MOU forms the initial part of the contract, and um, that's about as much as I can say about it. <laughs> I can, you can't I, go any further. I, I genuinely funny. wish I could say more, <laughs> but it's the nature of the beast. These yeah. things are competitive contracts for Australian yes. companies, including the Prime, so Northbrook Brown is obviously Up right. bidding against yeah. Boeing and other people. Yeah. Um, they all have a vested interest in keeping things quiet. 
and yeah. not to mention ITAR and all the other complexities that Rockets bring in for you know, security programs and I mean, the list goes on. Yeah. yeah, the complexities that go into this is just not a matter of being an amazing thing, it's also all the rest of it. Yeah. So one of the main things we're hiring for is paperwork. So being able to get the right forms filled out to maintain the right uh, reporting and all the rest of it is actually the hardest part of the job, believe it or not. Administration is the hard part. It really is. So I, I, I can make anything. <laughs> <laughs> Do the paperwork, that's not my <laughs> Yeah, mine either. Um, yeah, so I certainly understand you there. Um, so what about the um, last time we talked, there was also going to be an education program as well um, with with Hayley. Um, so what's happening with that? I mean, you said that you were signing um, deals with, uh, or looking at contract deals with with TAFE. So what else is happening? Is there anything you can talk about? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so TAFE, um, they're planning to do what's called taste the programs for schools. We yep. haven't finalised that contract yet, but I have no doubt it'll get through. So about 30,000 kids next year should be at high school when they do their taste of program to work out if they want to do trades, that sort of thing. So we'll yep. be making rocket motors as part of that program. Wow. So it's all funded by the state school yep. program for these kids to go and do it. Um, TAFE is going to have these rocket motors in those classrooms, put them pull apart, put back together and fire up. So oh, they're going to fire them? They are. Wow. Or wouldn't you want to? Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> Me, I'd love to see that. And you've said it, they're not that common. Yeah, no, exactly. And this stuff is for school age kids, so we're talking 14 year olds. Yep. It can't be at a level that. Obviously, the space industry is complicated, and I do try and make light that anyone can do it, but yep. you've got to start somewhere. And this is yep. about Correct. encouraging as low a level as we can get that's still functional, and then getting pretty much anyone to have to go off. And we think we've hit the nail right on the head about you know, accessibility, cost versus school food factor, right? Yeah, yeah, because that's exactly what you need to actually get people interested. So last time I was here as well, Nick was also alluding to something called Skydancer. Mm -hmm. What is Skydancer? What's happened with that? Yeah, so it got shut down, yep. just like everything else. Yep. Um, we are back into production with it, which is, in essence, the next step. Yep. So if we look at Haley being step one, yep. so taste high schools. Mm -hmm. Amber is high level taste, so we're talking about trades level, actually four to club trades. Yep. And then, the next step beyond that is then go to university graduate club level. That's what Skydance fits into. So oh, okay. it's an actual working rocket, so it flies. Um, so Haley is 30 kilos of thrust. Yep. Amber is 350 kilos of thrust. Skydance is 1.8 ton of thrust. Wow. Yeah, big jump. Yeah, that's a big jump. Probably it's about eight times each time. So yeah, yeah. Um, and Skydance represents pretty much the largest flight capable version that is these hybrids that we've been making yep. that you can get straight off the shelf. All right. So using standard size bells, standard size uh, bits of electronics, everything's standard. So yep. to go much beyond that, you have to start completely rebuilding everything. And again, Australia doesn't really have the industry to supply into that kind of thing. Yep. But we also don't want to because we want the cost to be as low and approachable as possible. Yeah. So having university students do this, it can't be 500 grand a rocket. This is just never going to work. Yeah, exactly. So the program we're working on, it should be about 150,000 for a rocket. Wow, which is cheap. Yeah. It's quite cheap, but the launch cost, which is part of it, is yeah. less than 10,000. Oh, wow. So that means that it's not, this is not space type rockets. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They're very much straight up, straight back. Black Sky Aerospace does this sort of stuff all the time. Yep. Hybrid tech though, so we're starting to get a little bit more intricate than yep. solids. Um, but still very much similar capability. The trick though is putting in front of the schools, university students, and asking them, okay, this is working. Yep. Improve upon. Yeah, right. okay. Go forth, multiply. <laughs> Which university students, I'm sure, are good at. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, let's not go down that path. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have bits of it here, yep. sitting behind me. Because that's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you what was that sitting behind you. So what, yeah. is, what is that? So this is the main uh, valve slash uh, oxidizer distribution yep. manifold for Skydancer. So it's going to sit right on top of the motor. Yep. Um, it's a little bit complicated to go into, but in essence, it's no different 
to what's inhaling and out. Oh, right. It's just a big valve that lacks on the visor into the combustion chamber. And that's a big valve. Big valve. Big one, man, but we're not using a big one. Oh, okay. Um, didn't end up meeting the flow, so it's all about yeah. how much of the visor can you get into the combustion chamber at per second. So yeah. this varies for 18 seconds. Yeah. About 110 kilos of nitrous oxide in those 18 seconds. Yeah. Which is about six to eight of the large NOS bottles in those spots. So every two seconds it's getting rid of one of the bottles. Yeah, and I'll have to remember to do that right next time. The voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> I got it wrong last time. Really wrong. We saw an amber. I can fire that six times on one of those bottles. Oh, wow. Whereas this is burning six in the hole. Yeah. So it's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. And the cars, Fast and Furious, they did a little squirt in the engine. Yeah. It's literally just a squirt. Squirt, yeah. Because where these are burning kilos and kilos and kilos of it. So what's the, what's the approximate height of something like Sky Dancer? What, what's the what's Yeah, what's, what, what, what altitude can it go up to? The simulations we've done. Yeah. And she's heavy, not designed to be efficient, right? Yep, it's about 45k. Oh wow. Roughly. Yeah. Yep, and this is just for university students to take up whatever. Well, it's higher than a wet balloon. Yep. But it sits in the realm that you and I've talked a little bit about. Yes. Where it doesn't fall too heavily into the space agency purview, so it starts to minimise some of the issues with paper and a few other things. Yep, this still sits well in the range of CASA. So you don't have to do as much work to try and launch them on a regular basis, basically. Right. If we were going much more than that, the amount of the baking or hiring people for paperwork, the amount of paperwork you have to do would make it almost that run. Forget the money, but it's just yeah. too much work. Paperwork, yeah. yeah. Right. So, do you have anything in the in works at the moment that's bigger that you can talk about clearly? <laughs> I mean, obviously, is, is there anything that you you work on? Because last time you last time I was here, you showed me what was going to be Sky Dancer, and obviously Sky Dancer is moving quite along quite rapidly um, in terms of rocketry and all that sort of stuff. This is quite a rapid phase. Um, so, is there anything bigger you've got planned? There is, but I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> so, our school, our school program is going to be over two years. Yep. Haley is the first 18 months of it. There's actually yep. a second part to that, which I haven't talked to anyone about. Oh, okay. And um, you're not going to talk to me. So, no exclusives. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> when it starts, we'll, we'll definitely be back. Oh, excellent. Um, and really, it's just. All the same, so it's growing what we currently have to make sure that it's self sufficient and then moving on to the next step. So, if we get these 50 motors out into schools next year, which there's no reason why we shouldn't really, then that'll be the impetus to get turn a lot of that money back in on itself, expand that out, and now we're just self sufficient. Yeah. We're not relying on Pier Flight 4 to maintain what is, in essence, quite an expensive hobby. <laughs> But it's a cool hobby that I, I don't mind saying that it's a bit of a hobby. I mean, I do work for a living, <laughs> people would think, but I have a lot of fun too. Obviously. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, you've got to love what you do and do what you love. I love my job. Yeah. I can tell that. Everyone in this room loves their job. It is honestly very exciting. Like, you've heard some of the stories which we can't talk about. Yeah. The stuff that's going to be happening over the next two years. It's not world leading in any way, shape, or form. Like we're not we're not gonna be reinventing anything that Hawaii hasn't seen before. Yeah. But for Australia, it's really gonna set the pace of okay, how does Australia get involved? What can we do? What is Australia capable of doing today? And what should they be working towards within that two to five year time frame? And what you know, challenges that's gonna bring across. And this significant. Yeah, it's not we can't step into the global space economy overnight. It's there's just no way. So, so, what are, so just on that, what are some of the challenges that, that well, you can open? No, we can't about. talk about that. Yet. Yeah, because yeah. the process is not secret, right? Yep. So, one of the biggest hurdles that Australia doesn't know is skill base. Now, yep. a number of companies have talked about this. We, we certainly have the engineering capability, but the variance between what is classified as earth based engineering to what space based engineering, there is a definite. Step yeah, forward. Yeah. So we have to learn how to space qualify, basically. Yeah. That that skill set is not something we can bring from the states very easily. Um, ITAR restricts a lot of that information. Um, a lot of documents I have are all redacted. Yeah. The but 
that means that we have to get engineering, have to sit down and, and actually try and nut through and build from scratch the understanding of the process. Again, lots of paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> um, but practice, so it's all about R and D. Yeah. Build something, break it, repair it, go again. Just constantly iterate through thousands of different concepts until you get to something. I've heard that before. Yeah. It sounds like fail fast, fail forward. I yeah. wonder who that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But the point is, that's basic principles. Right? Yeah, yeah. And First principles of engineering. Exactly. Just don't, yeah, don't try and be the new fancy wheel. Yeah. Get the wheel. Yeah. Then try and go forward. And, and that's the thing. We need to actually get the wheel first. We need to get those fundamental first principles right. nailed down before we can actually move forward. And this is, in my view, the principal argument for Australia doing launch. Yep. If we, let's say we're a Formula One racing car company. Yep. So we're the last country in the world to build one. Let's say it's that, right? And we go up to the, you know, start line or whatever. I can't watch lots of sports. Yeah. Me either. I'm more of a, more of a rocket nerd. I'm always at work. <laughs> so we're that new team. Now we might have really fancy electronics, we might have a really good driver, we might have really good aerodynamics, and a whole bunch of other things. But let's say we can't change tyres on our own car, yeah. but we keep going to the other teams and say, can you please change our tyres? You know, we need this to be done, blah, blah, Yeah. They're always going to be looking at us like we're not taking it seriously, we're not, we're not a true team. What launch does is get us to that level where we've got all the basics nailed. We understand what doing space environments like. We, we have engineers and people that come to understand safety programs, all the rest of it. That's what launch does. It's very expensive. Yeah. It doesn't get any financial outcomes. But on a globe stage, now we're talking about actually playing at a similar level. We're on the same playing field. As everybody else. As everybody else. Because everyone else does launch. Yeah, exactly. And they see it as a right of entry. Yeah. So when you try and talk to you know, any suppliers overseas, they're always looking at us like, well, let us know once you actually get serious about this stuff and we'll start with the interview, which is difficult. Yeah. Right? Now, we can build rocket motors. Like, I build rocket motors. They're complex. Yeah. We've, we've dumb them down as much as we can. But at some point, someone in Australia has to launch a rocket yeah. from Australian industry to really before we can take it seriously. It's just that simple. Yeah. Okay. And I wish it was different. <laughs> but I, I, also, I also understand the analogy that they're seeing it as a bit of a test. Yeah. If you can't do that, you know, yeah. we'll keep watching your satellites, but we're still not we're not gonna be buying your satellites because we have our own satellite manufacturer. Where's yeah, the right. frequency, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And put plus all the restrictions that you alluded to, like ITAR and things like that, which is you know, they can't actually share that because it's under under those acts. So you're sharing that knowledge and information it's, it's hard to come by. So that dictates we have to we have to yeah, start, start from scratch. We have to do it ourselves. Yeah. So even if someone... Which is the Australian way, really. Well, it's a challenge. Yeah, great. <laughs> Lucky, though, right? Yeah. But we can't even employ someone from overseas, someone that's made uh, liquid rocket motors that we plan to do here. We can't even bring them here to do it because the information in the head is restricted on the Oh, really? Yeah. So wow. the legislation works that they can't write a book, they can't write an email, they can't come teach someone here, they can't do any of that because technically they're signing, you know, yeah, yeah, over there. Yeah, and it's all restricted. Yeah, so the other part of that problem is, while we haven't stepped up to that plate and we have all these restrictions, and America's not prepared to open up their borders to allow information the other way. Yeah. So we can't go work for SpaceX for example, because we don't know the technology. And for an Australian to go over there and work, they would learn that. What's stopping them coming back here and teaching it? So I tell that barrier works both ways. So until we do it ourselves, they're not going to invite us over there. So wow. we can't work for SpaceX anymore. Wow. We work for Tesla. <laughs> Which all my brothers do. But we can't work for SpaceX. One dream at a time, mate. One dream at a time. Yeah. So if we're thinking about doing, you know, missions to the space station or other things like that, we're not concluded because we haven't done it. Right. So again, this all falls back. We don't have a chance to cast tire. Yeah. So they're just looking at us like, we're not being serious yet. Yeah, okay. okay. So we've got, to, we've got to do it, you know, at some point we have to do it. Yeah, and we, which is why I imagine this is here, but it's, it's because we need to actually develop that. This is nowhere near. Oh, no, 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 I know, I know that, but it's a start, it's a, on the pathway It's too. trying to show the right people and get the university students thinking about it. Yeah. So 
starting from scratch, that they would develop the tech that every country already has, yeah. to then be able to do the launches to orbit and other things like that on a regular basis. Just that it's got to be every day. Yeah. Not not launching every day, but it's just got to be every day capability. Yeah, correct. Which we already have, rather than going out to buy it. Well, yeah, we buy it. Yeah. It's right. the same way of going to Formula One team and hiring someone else to change their tires. <laughs> it's like, okay, fine, we've done all the rest of it, sure, but we're we're just not doing that bit. It's yeah. Just, I think it's a genuine mistake. Yeah. But I also know it is a very passionate push by a lot of people in Australia to make that happen. Yeah. I'm sure it will. Yeah. I don't know what sort of time frame. You know, there's launch facilities being announced and other things, which is fantastic. But unfortunately, where we sit at the moment, the financial issues and all other things, it's just, it's slow. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, I mean, this is fascinating. Thing. This is, this is, you like it? Yeah, I love it. I want one. So, the fun thing about that is the 42. Yeah, yeah. 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 answer what you think. Because everything. Of course. Cool. Cool. Fucking sandwich. So, yeah, so to, talking about um, so the exciting things that are happening in the Australian um, space industry, um, focusing on that in particular, um, the the Australian Space Agency is doing a lot of things towards the Moon to Mars, all that sort of stuff. The offering. advanced program. Yeah, the advanced program, all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, just to, what are you, your general thoughts about how the Australian Space Industry is moving forward with the other guidance of the um, Australian Space Agency? Yeah, so post COVID, obviously, everyone's always talking about it. Yeah. Any sort of initiative that's going to kick, start those sort of things and start to say, look, if we're going to. Yeah, at least we're going to start spilling up all that. Yeah, great. fantastic. Yep. You know, no one's no one's ever come and thought about that. Yep. There are obviously some complexities around how this is going to be rolled out, but federal government programs always hard to manage and start. I'm sure in five years' time we'll go look back and go, well, that wasn't too bad. Yeah, exactly. So um, they did do a great thing, which is they've shifted it from being 50 50 pay to 50 25. Right. Which makes it a lot easier for companies to get involved, like itself. We'd love to be. We're not too sure if we fit just yet, which is oh, very hard. Yep. Um, but we do we do really hope that it becomes something where we can step into the realm to start working with vital space industry and be a part of the return of man. I know. Consist of Apollo and that'd be awesome. Man. First one on the moon. moon yeah. Yeah. Well, the return of the moon is about setting up the right location. Yeah, correct. It's about finding water and other things for resources, but testing the equipment that we're going to use for base, exactly. Yep. So there's a whole program that's very well documented. Definitely something Australia should be involved in because yes. remote, as, remote asset management plus in situ resource utilisation. Yep. Try very hard not to use the <laughs> um, Australia is very good at that sort of stuff and we yep. should play a bigger role. Yep. Um, it's definitely where Australia, if Australia's industry is interested in getting involved in this, those are the two areas you should really be can do, which is basically automation systems of various types. Yeah, we seem to be really skilled at that at the moment, like AI and automation. But, and all that sort but, of but this is on the path where we need to be, and which is actually creating the interest in it. So we can actually run. Great, exactly that, exactly that. If we don't do it in that order, we're gonna fall off a cliff. And, yeah. You know, but we're, we're at a very slow pace, which is actually okay in some ways. Yeah. But we should be doing the other things, like we said, if we want to get away from space, at least break down some other barriers. And trying to open up the industry a bit more. Yeah, correct. All right. So the last question I have, um, I guess more than anything else, because I'm sure people will be curious, is are you guys hiring? And what are you what are you skills are you looking for? Are you looking for someone to uh, document things on YouTube? Because <laughs> I know you don't. <laughs> always have to have your back. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> um, we are always looking for people. Yeah. Primarily we're looking for extremely wide base of skills. Okay. Because we can't afford that a lot of people. Yep. So multi-skilled people is pretty much critical. Um, extremely enthusiastic. So these are like yourself, you know. Yeah. You literally use the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something I've never been called before. Oozed. There you go. <laughs> you know what it is. Like, yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Someone who is really passionate and excited to get fired up about space is as soon as it's actually cool. not that hard to find. No. But then I need the backgrounds and other things that yeah. comes to it. Yeah, correct. You know, and it is what it is. We're yeah. working on a lot of programs. The whole STEM program we're working on is to do exactly that. We believe that this is a 10 plus year time frame. Yeah. I want kids getting excited today so that 
in, you know, as I grow this, I have the pool of people to start drawing from. Oh, you're doing this to build a pool of people that so you can use. What up? Wow! Is that wow, that's, that's one way of doing it. <laughs> that's awesome. We can't find the right type of person. Of course. And, and, that's, and that's the thing, that goes back to what you were saying earlier, which is you need, you need people in-house to actually do it inside our country, because you can't hire it from overseas. I can't hire Yeah. But we need extremely creative, yeah. problem-solved, resilient. I mean, I could list them all. Yeah. We've got to be extremely capable of working a team, high, you know, intense, yeah. extremely difficult, demoralising. <laughs> um, but I also know that we are government's industry. Yeah. I need those, that talent to start yeah. coming up. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to be going anywhere. This is definitely long term for me. This is my yeah. life for the rest of whatever it is going to be. Yeah. So, what does that mean in five, ten years? Well, if I do what I'm supposed to be doing, I need 100 plus people. Correct. You know, so. Yeah, we need to get it from where I'm coming from. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And you're creating that too. Well, we see it. it's odd that we see, and this is a little bit kind of off topic, but we see schools as producing a product. Now, that product is highly employable resource of skills in essence. Yeah. Now that that's not a detriment topic to the students because really the better the product, which is them, the yep. more likely are very successful careers. Of course. So this is about if if all of us industry, governments, schools, public can get on the idea that we need to make the best, highest quality thing as we can, well that's only good for everyone. Yeah, correct. But if industry isn't explaining accurately to the schooling industry what that product needs to look like, well, we're not going to get what we want. Yeah, correct. So industry has to step up and get directly involved in making sure that they're requesting the right sort of product coming out the end for what they need. And because we are shifting into what is in essence a new industry, which is high advanced manufacturing through high tech industries, so defense and aerospace, we have to start looking at this at a totally different level to what Australia has done before. Yeah. So it's rebuilding education from the ground up for the right outcomes to meet the demand of the future. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time again, Nick. It's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you. And um, look, I hope to be invited along to some of the other stuff we're talking about off camera. Uh, I, love, <laughs> I love the way you put that on. <laughs> so when I agree to it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, look, it, there's, there's lots more than, than Nick is oh, there's, so, there, there, there's certainly is working on, and it's one of those things that like, I'd like to be there. But yeah, it's, it's certainly always been a pleasure. It's always interesting to come and have a chat to you and to see exactly where you've come from, you know, that you've, the suitcase rocket engine is now called Halley, or Haley, sorry, get it wrong every single time, called Haley, and you've got Skydancer, and you've got, you've got everything going on in the background, the education program. I think Nick from the FI Aerospace is going to be one of Thanks again, mate. No problem. All right, so I hope everyone managed to enjoy that um, SAA special edition of the Space Down Under. Um, both of these, there are actually two videos that will be um, essentially loaded to YouTube after the end of this meeting. Uh, so there'll be that one there was the special SAA edition, and then there will also be the special extended version as well, where I actually, where Nick Green and I actually spoke a lot and nerded out uh, a little bit more behind the scenes. So um, I believe there's some questions and answers if um, that's available. Stand by, just saying. <laughs> You're all right. You're all right. Uh, we did have a question, but I think somebody's answered it, but you might be able to help us. Uh, uh, what sort of payload is that sudden launch rocket that we saw uh, in my tail end of my presentation? Are you aware with what uh, the sort of payload was on that sudden launch rocket? Um, as I'm aware, um, because of the apogee it was trying to reach, this is just as I'm aware, and I've heard um, through third parties and other people in the uh, Australian space industry, uh, what happened was that went up to 87 or 89 kilometres or something like that, but it was a very small payload. It was only, it only measured in the grams. So um, it wasn't very large payload at all. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that's as far as I'm aware. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, so j Josh, just to let you know, uh... The, the the audio that we got, a lot of us got, was a bit scratchy, so oh, there might have been some oh, stuff. That, that's okay. Uh, so 
as you mentioned, this uh, this has been recorded, but it'll also be available at your YouTube channel. So you yes. might want to just highlight that for people and we can go, we'll put a link into our Space Association page yeah. as well. Yes, so what I'll do is straight after this is you can um, have a look on YouTube for me. Um, it'll all be on the, the space down under. I have a whole um, segment where I've actually interviewed Nick Green previously. So he actually showed me last year, demonstrated the, the hybrid rocket engine which can be fired on school grounds, which is AMBER. He also showed me the in-construction Haley rocket, which was um, currently being put together. And then a few weeks later, he showed me the uh, the other one as well, which was uh, uh, Haley as a demonstrator. As a demonstrator, uh, I've also managed to interview a few other people in the Australian space industry as well, including Adam Gilmore um, and uh, John Moody. So there is the whole space down under there. So if you want to go on that, along and have a look, uh, you can find everything off my uh, my webpage, which is joshkeegan.com. I will send out links to both videos, both the SAA special edition and the um, the extended cut, which is basically me and Nick nerding out a lot um, and doing a lot of SpaceX fanboying. Um, so yes, both versions will be available immediately after the end of this um, meeting tonight. Sure. So where is, where's Nick, uh, where's his operation located? Uh, Nick is PF, uh, Products for Industry, which is PFI, and they're located in Dara in Queensland. Right. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much, Josh. Sorry about the mucked up introduction to you. I got a bit crossed okay. up with uh, my system here, so I didn't uh, do you the justice here. I really appreciate you, you coming along tonight okay. and uh, having you on board. It's been fantastic. Um, I'm going to move right along. I'm going to uh, share my screen and introduce our, our, our next speaker. Um, here we go. Right, so that was Joss's slides. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks once again, if, uh, everybody. And uh, now we're on to our third and, and uh, um, last presenter, Christopher Wanjek. Uh, Christopher is, a, is a, he received a bachelor's degree in journalism from Temple University and a master's degree from Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, he's an author of several books, Bad Medicine, Misconceptions and Misuses Revealed from Distance Healing to Vitamin O and Food at Work, uh, Workplace Solutions for Malnutrition, Obesity and Chronic Obesity and Chronic Diseases. And uh, these books, particularly about the, um, the, the second one I mentioned there, has got very high, uh, high reviews and uh, it's a well-respected uh, um, piece of, uh, of writing. And um, it basically has kicked off some progress projects inspired by government legislation, um, Mexico, Lithuania, U Uruguay, and South America. Um, as an astronomy writer, uh, Chris uh, worked at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in, in Greenbelt, Maryland until 2007. And he freelanced um, for astronomy magazine. Someone's got their microphone on there. I'm hearing a lot of clicking and clacking. Um, He's currently the armchair astrophysics columnist for the Astronomical Society of the Pacific's Mercury uh, magazine and uh, as a health writer uh, he wrote stories for CBF Health Watch, the Washington Post, a weekly column in live science called Bad Medicine and um, in 2009 his life science column criticized Pope Benedict who said the condoms make epidemics, ep epidemic, epidemic of AIDS worse so hmm, we would have gotten a bit of trouble with that one. A bit of controversy is always good. Um, and while a student at Temple University, uh, in, uh, he uh, was part of a, a comedy scene and produced uh, um, different comics. And he also had a stint writing for Jay Leno uh, um, uh, from 1998. Uh, Chris's uh, book, he's here to speak with us tonight, is called uh, Spacefarers, How Humans Will Settle the Moon, Mars and Beyond. Uh, it's available through, or it's published through Harvard University Press. Uh, it's got really good reviews, including from yours truly. I read it and uh, I loved it. It was fantastic. So this review uh, from uh, Skeptic Magazine, uh, the best book on space exploration since Isaac Asimov. So it was Michael Schremer. And he's joining us now live from the US, if he's still there. It's, keep in mind, it's super, super early in Baltimore. And Chris has been on the, on the session for the whole, um, the whole, from the start of the meeting. So thank you for that. I'll stop sharing, Chris, and I'll hand over to you if you're still uh, if you're still awake. Okay, I'm here. I forgot about Pope Benedict. Thank you for 
<laughs> Bringing up those painful memories with the Pope. Is that when your uh, house got struck by lightning, was it, Chris? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Sure. And um, I don't see anything to share. That's uh, problematic. Um, I have my presentation open. Let me uh, in, in the Zoom window. Stop that and share again, maybe. There it is. Okay, coming along. It's uh, getting to slide view. I'm going to block that, I think, because it's giving me worries. Okay, very good. I really wish I could be down there joining you. You can hear me okay? A little nod, Peter. You can hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Thumbs up. Um, you know, when I found out that you guys often meet in the context of a local pub, I was even more uh, frustrated that I couldn't be down there with you to join you. Uh, so what I did is I decided to uh, put my coffee into a beer glass so that I could share a dark one with you, at least symbolically. So cheers. Just hope to uh, a stimulating conversation. Um, so I'll try to do this in a half hour. I think we might be able to get out to Mars by that point. I know it's a big solar system. Um, but I wanted to say something briefly about the book, my uh, book, Space Fairs. My idea is I wanted to present, you know, what was possible, what was probable in space, what we're probably going to do. Um, lots of about what's possible. And let's face it, we could live on, you know, any planet or moon in a solar system. That's all possible. We could do that today. But there's no economic or emotional motivation to be in every single place in the solar system. I mean, think about your own experiences um, in Australia, me in America, our ancestors, maybe you yourself migrated to this destination, you know, mostly for economic and emotional reasons. You didn't go to Australia or they didn't go to Australia just because someone invented a boat, you know, and, and likewise, you know, we could get to the top of Mount Everest now. Lots of people are climbing up there but no one's living up there, you know, despite the beautiful view. No one lives on Mount Everest because it's just not practical. You know, what do you do for a living? You know, what are your kids going to do? And the solar system is a lot like that, isn't it? There's some spectacular views out there, but are we really going to live out there, colonize it, settle it? What are you going to do for a living? You know, what's your kids going to do? Can you even grow up in such an environment? So that's what I was trying to elicit in this book. And, and that said, yeah, I do think we're going to be on the moon in something looking like this in 10 or 15 years. I think we're going to be on Mars in, in about 15 or 20 years in something simple like this. Will we be in uh, orbiting cities with artificial gravity and low Earth orbit? Well, you know, maybe by the end of this century, because I, I do think there are economic and emotional motivations to get us to that point. But before we do, in the decades to come, we're going to immensely increase our presence in low Earth orbit with a stepping stone towards this, with like space hotels and space factories, space resorts. Uh, that's the natural progression to something like this. And I even think we're going to get to Venus uh, somehow. Um, this is the uh, atmosphere of Venus. It's a proposed NASA mission to be in the clouds above Venus. You may have heard that we discovered um, <clears throat> the phosphine in, in the atmosphere, and that's a possible biological uh, signal of life there. It's very speculative. The phosphine is real, but, you know, whether it's from life, who knows. But we should send a probe and, just, you know, learn more. And if there's life on Venus, by all means, we could go there and live in surprising comfort above the hellish surface. And we're going to drive there. That's how we're going to get there. <laughs> okay, so this obviously is in jest, but this is an actual picture you might know uh, of uh, the, the Telsa, uh, Tesla automobile launched by SpaceX, driven by a mannequin on its way to Mars. A fascinating picture, but I, I think it's very symbolic too for me of what I think SpaceX and other companies, their role is in, in driving our exploration of the universe. They're going to help make this possible. But before I talk about what I think we're going to do out there. I think we should talk about why we're going to do it. Because I think there's a, a basic misconception from my point of view. Our, our message doesn't necessarily endear others to our movement to do more in space because it's a bit pessimistic. It's this idea of leaving the earth. 
uh, because something's going to happen here. Even Stephen Hawking has said that we have to clear out of this place in 100 years because something we're, we need to be a multi planet species, right? We need to be on the moon and Mars in case something terrible happens on Earth. But I mean, that's so illogical to me because I can't think of anything really that would happen to the Earth that would make it less pleasant to live on than any place else in the solar system, Mars included. I mean, look at these are the ideas that people put out there. Population overload. Well, that's, that's the opposite of extinction, isn't it? With too, much, too many people. But I don't think there's too many people on Earth. The problem is there's just too much inefficiency. I mean, we waste half of our food. We waste 10 to 50% of our electricity on these uh, leaky um, energy grids. You know, all the methane we don't capture, all the fertilizer that we don't use properly, let it run into the ocean. There's incredible efficiencies that we could have to have billions more people on Earth. And I actually think that's a good idea because more people mean more ideas, more entrepreneurs, more inventor inventors. I'm all pro people uh, and we can do that with space resources helping us. The pandemic, of course, that's horrible. We're in one now. I personally know two people who have died from COVID-19, but no virus has ever wiped out human beings before. So why would this happen now in the era of DNA sequencing and vaccines? It doesn't make any sense. No virus can kill every single person. Nuclear war, asteroid strikes are kind of the same thing, aren't they? You know, there's some horrible bombardment. I think it's a very real risk. It's slight, but real. But again, in terms of wiping out the human race, billions of people might die, absolutely. But hundreds of thousands will survive. You know, civilization will be set back by a couple hundred years. I'm not advocating for this, but there's going to be people surviving in, in well-fortified underground bunkers. Let's face it, these nuts that we don't like, who knows what the next generation is going to be. But also people, you know, living in caves, you know, eating uh, canned beans that they stole from the supermarket that got abandoned. You know, there's going to be people who survive such a scenario. And here's the, the, the illogic of it all. You know, we're, we're smarter than the dinosaurs. If we were living on Mars in some independent way, we would have the space technology to do so. We would have the space technology to, to, to um, push an astero asteroid aside. We would be able to, I mean, we would probably jump on the thing and start mining it, teaching it a lesson. Um, we could easily deflect an asteroid if we were already on Mars. And likewise with um, climate change, which I actually do think is the greatest threat to, to life, all life on Earth right now. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but there's engineering solutions uh, coming down the line. That said, the same ill logic that if we were living on, if we had the technology to be on Mars, we would be living in these mini Earths. And if we could do that on Mars, we would do that on Earth, right? You know, if we could terraform Mars, we would terraform Earth back to Earth if we made it so horrible here. So these aren't threats. This is actually the only threat that I could think of. Some alien race coming in <laughs> and vaporizing the Earth, right, for an intergalactic superhighway. There's no solution to that one. You just have to frost your fingers that that one doesn't happen. This is the message I think we should be sending out there to get other people involved in space and to share our excitement. We're doing this not to escape Earth, but to make it better. And we're already started that, right, with these communication satellites and weather satellites. That has, you know, increased uh, the, uh, the prospects of life for so many people. It's made life so much better for so many people. And we just want to continue that, you know, with uh, space technology, we could be putting our energy production out in space with solar panels in low Earth orbit. We could do fusion or fission on the moon. We could put computers in low Earth orbit where they'd be incredibly more efficient at 40 Kelvin or even 4 Kelvin. That's where they want to operate. We could do the worst possible kinds of mining, the most polluting kind, get that on the moon where there are, is no life to worry about. And finally, build these, you know, the microgravity factories that we, we've long wanted to build these interesting molecules and semiconductors. We can start doing that for the betterment of mankind. Um, and then, you know, the fun stuff, the lunar tourism and such, maybe go to the moon and Mars. That, in my mind, is secondary to what we're really after about improving life on Earth by venturing out into space. Um, and of course, the hardest thing is getting off this rock, right? <laughs> that first hundred kilometers is a doozy. Once you're up there, then, then we're good to go. Um, and rockets, as you know, are just terribly inefficient. It's the only way up there right now. But when you look at a rocket, 
that is 95% metal and fuel, right? You know, it's only about two to 5% payload. And that's rather inefficient. That's why these things are so expensive. And, and, and the prices have been coming down with the likes of, you know, Elon Musk and, and even Rocket Lab over in New Zealand. The price is now down to about $2,000 per kilogram, you know, depending on you, how you measure it. But that's, a, that's about a factor of 10 down from where it was about two decades ago. And that's remarkable progress. Imagine if they could keep on doing that just with market efficiencies and get it down another factor of 10 to maybe a couple hundred dollars per uh, kilogram. That's like a cost of an overnight package, isn't it, from Australia to, uh, new, um, to the States. Um, but then we have to go a little bit beyond that and because there's only so much, so far we could get with these market efficiencies. But there's possibly new rocket fuels out there. The most promising I've seen is metallic hydrogen, which was created at uh, Harvard University, um, thought to exist in the core of Jupiter. I mean, very hard to uh, actually produce. But if they could ramp up production and more importantly, store it safely, this would have a tremendous kick, several orders of magnitude better than any rocket fuel. And we could get the, the price of rockets, uh, the cargo, probably down to tens of dollars per kilogram. So even more and more things could get into space step by step. And then beyond that, I think we just have to get, if we, we have to get away from rockets eventually, right? We can't have tens of thousands of people going into space every day by relying on all these rockets. I mean, the noise would just be crazy if you think about it that way. We're going to have to find a new highway into space, essentially. Lots of people talk about the space elevator, which I think is cool as all hell, right? I mean, it's a fascinating idea. We can do it on the moon and Mars. I think it would work there. I just don't think it's practical for Earth. Uh, not for the technical reasons. You know, of course, this is a cable stretching uh, from Earth out to geosynchronous orbit. That's 36,000 um, kilometers away, held taut by a counterweight at the top going around the Earth. Um, but there's no cable strong enough to hold that tension, right? It would just snap in half. But even if there were, and there could be technology coming along in 10 or 15 years, I don't doubt that. It's the practical aspects of this. Where do you put it? Because <laughs> you have to protect it from terrorism, right? You know, you're know, you gonna have some nut wanting to drive an airplane into it and bring the whole thing down. That would be horrible. I mean, this thing would wrap around the whole earth when it comes down. I mean, that would just be uh, you know, mind blowing uh, destruction. And then worse yet, more menacing is the, you know, the, um, all the space junk in low Earth orbit that's going to be constantly hitting this thing and destabilizing the whole cable. It, it really just isn't practical, unfortunately. And, but there's better ideas and actually more practical and cheaper ideas. And one fascinating idea is the sky hook, literally a hook dangling from the sky. You could have many of these things. They're, um, you know, they're in orbit, but touching into a uh, um, the upper atmosphere. You could reach that with a sounding rocket or even a high altitude balloon or airplane. You get your cargo attached to it and flip it up into space. It's, we could do this now with modern technology. It's a matter of putting the investment into it. Same as orbiting rings and orbital rings, which is a, a bit mind blowing, but actually simpler than a space elevator. It's exactly what it sounds like. This will be ri a ring around the whole planet. And I just mentioned the space junk. We already have, in many ways, a ring around our planet, don't we? <laughs> but if you could have coordinated space junk, right? If you have these you know, metal uh, rings that you just launch into orbit and then start fusing together until it reaches around the entire planet, OK? And so conceptually, it's easy enough to do. And then you send an electric current through it and magnetize it. So now it becomes like a maglev train. You know, this thing is like moving at 10 kilometers per second. It's an orbital speed, okay? And it's actually like a maglev train in reverse where the rails are moving. But then you can levitate a platform above there, many platforms. They would be stationary. And you could be up on that platform. And at that point, you're not in, you're not in orbit. You're just at orbital height, but not orbital velocity. You could just pull up cargo from the Earth at that point, pull up people, you could have platforms up there for space planes that never touch Earth, that just take off to the moon or take off to our hotels out there. Um, of course, this would cost trillions of dollars to build, even with the lower space costs. But 
that's what countries do, don't they? They invest in railroads, they invest in, in highway systems. At some point, it's going to make sense when you have enough commerce out there that this is going to be the practical way to go. You know, the U.S. international, the interstate uh, highway system in the United States costs $500 billion to build, an incredible fee, but the investment is paid off six to one in terms of the commerce that has enabled once Chicago wanted to start talking to Houston, <laughs> you know, wanted to travel back and forth, that highway started making sense. Uh, and eventually this is going to make sense. We're gonna get away from rockets and do something like this, way down the line, but this is where we need to be going in order to grow our presence in space. So a big, there's only three people up here right now, the International Space Station. And, you know, it's a bit sacrilegious in many circles to say that I'm not a big fan of the International Space Station. When you think that this thing costs $150 billion to build and only 220 some people have visited it. You know, we're spending a half a billion dollars per person to get somebody up there. That's really not sustainable. Um, but I do think, you know, really interesting things are popping up, so to speak. This is an inflatable habitat that Robert Bigelow Bigelow Aerospace put on, attached to the International Space Station. And um, they did this in 2016. It's still there being used as storage, holding up incredibly well. Here's Bigelow down here at the bottom. I can't quite point to it here. Um, and uh, he has bigger ideas. These are the B-330s. The 330 stands for 330 cubic meters of volume, which is more volume than the, the livable area, li livable volume on the International Space Station. He can build and launch these things for one, less than one hundredth of the cost of the ISS. And this is what's coming this decade. Imagine these things as, you know, uh, factories in space or uh, laboratories in space or hotels in space. Um, that's what Bigelow wants to do with the hotel. He's in a hotel business. Uh, he's a billionaire that made his money in hotels. He wants to launch these things, invite people up there to spend a week or two. And of course, only the ultra rich are going to be able to do it at first. Um, but even Tom Cruise, who um, wants to uh, film the next Mission Impossible movie in one of these things mid-decade. This is where we're going next with low Earth orbit. It's a very easy way to get more activity into low Earth orbit. You could have your um, assembly line in there, a microgravity assembly line. You don't have to worry about some expensive uh, ISS type unit. Okay, so eventually we'll get to the moon. And uh, Peter had a, a, actually a spot on uh, summary of the, of the US um, <clears throat> uh, situation with it, when it comes to space. I can only add that the less presidential involvement, the better. I mean, it's, it's, that it's ridiculous the way we have it set up here. We don't, the reason why our space science program has been so successful, getting things to Mars, getting things to Saturn, is because the presidents don't decide, oh, I want an infrared uh, <laughs> telescope. And then the next president comes in, no, I don't like infrared. I want to go ultraviolet. That discussion never happens. That discussion is left to peer review, as it should be. So the presidents only come in with more or less bad ideas and NASA makes them worse. And this idea of going in 2024 is detrimental to our efforts to have permanency on the moon um, because we don't wanna go for pride. That's a waste of money. We wanna set up infrastructure first uh, so that we can eventually get there the right way. So I'm hoping this idea goes away, but again, it's just a lot of money spent and goes away. Then a new idea comes in and you spend money. So we can talk more about that. I do have obviously strong opinions uh, in the question and answer. I can talk more. But what's interesting, I think, about the moon is that it's going to be a lot like Antarctica. Um, we have this whole model set up with Antarctica. Uh, we have science bases down there, you know, run by countries. Australia is down there. And um, we have scientists who go for just a couple months per year when the weather permits. And you have some rugged group that can stay around year round. But no one lives on Antarctica. No one owns Antarctica. Probably going to be the same for the moon. No one's going to live there or own it, right? But they could visit it there. Um, and most very interesting to me is that, well, actually, the easiest place to go is the South Pole on the moon. And that's because the moon doesn't have a tilt. So it's getting relatively constant sunshine 80% of the time. And because of that, 
there's a constant temperature of about a minus 50 Celsius, which is cold but manageable. As you might know, on, you know anywhere else, like on the equators, there's this day-night cycle you have to contend with, where during the day, which lasts two weeks long, it gets up to 130 degrees Celsius. And then at night, without the sun for two weeks, it gets down to uh, about a minus 170 degrees Celsius. I mean, so that's not fit for man or beast or, or machines for that matter. I mean, you can't do much there. The Apollo astronauts had to go a few days during the dawn or the dusk where the temperature was just right. Uh, but on the moon, you have that constant temperature. And then some of these craters here, um, you have, actually they're high enough that there's perpetual sunlight. So you have constant solar energy up there. And it's also cool that down in these shadowed craters, they never get any sunlight. And there's ice deposits there that you can collect. Uh, and you can obviously melt the ice to drink or use uh, for human biology. But also, this is just mind blowing to me. The ice is essentially rocket fuel. Um, ice is H2O. And rocket fuel is hydrogen and oxygen. That's the propellant. Um, so there are billions of dollars worth of rocket propellant <laughs> in these ice craters that we could um, use to propel ourselves back to Earth or, or deeper into uh, uh, the solar system. I just think that's a neat idea. So I do think we can be sustainable on the moon without the profit, uh, just from government activities, again, with that Antarctica model. Um, right now in the U.S., the National Science Foundation is what supports the Antarctic uh, program at about a half a billion dollars a year. Uh, meanwhile, NASA is spending four billion dollars a year just, just to support the International Space Station. Um, and there, it's very controversial right now. You saw that flip between the Democrats one and, 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 and the Republicans. And while well, the Republicans don't have much of a stance on the ISS, but there's this, this idea of decommissioning it in 2025 to stop NASA funding, at least for the U.S. portion, because it is international. Um, and I do actually think that's a fine idea, because I think at this point we should just hand it over to commercial enterprises. Now that our governments have done so well in teaching us how to live and work in space, let the commercial enterprises go in at this point, make the moon sort of like the new ISS. Use that $4 billion in the NASA budget to set up a, a foundation of learning on the moon so we can learn how to live on the moon, how to work on the moon, and eventually businesses might be able to get into there a couple of decades from now. And that's because that's speculative right now of, of what kind of money can be made on the moon. There's lots of talk about mining, which is practical if there's a market, of course. You know, you got all this iron and silicon and aluminum, and to see this, you have to scoop it up uh, on, on the surface. But that only works if you have something to use those minerals for. If we're building massive structures in space, that's the perfect place to get them on the moon. We don't need them on the Earth. Um, but until we're at that point where we're building structures, the mining isn't that uh, profitable of a concept that there would be investors willing to <laughs> invest in this. Um, likewise, with some other speculative ideas about rare earth elements on the moon, uh, they're, they're in great supply there, but they're actually, there's a lot of them on the earth. Uh, Australia has large deposits of the rare earths. Uh, these are very valuable in that in any given iPhone uses all 17 rare earth elements. Uh, United States has deposits. We choose not to mine them because they're very polluting. Uh, but China has 80% of the market right now because they're at this point in their development where they care less about the environment and more about building their economy. Um, so unless there was some major effort to stop polluting the earth, which unfortunately I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon, mining these kind of things on the moon just doesn't uh, make any sense right now. Um, there's some hazards to ha um, we'll have to deal with on the moon that people really don't talk about that much. It's this, this, this gravity issue that people just assume everything's fine with low gravity. So, but you know, when you think about gravity, we only have two data points. We got the Earth and we got, you know, low Earth orbit, ISS, uh, Mir, you know, so we know Earth at one G is good, you know, zero G bad, you know, but how do these, how do these points connect? Is it a linear relationship between the two? Or maybe you just need a little bit of gravity on the moon is what we're hoping on to have you know good health 
or maybe you need like a lot of gravity before you know you have good health. We have no idea. I, you know, it, it would just be very surprising to me to think we could live a long time on the moon in 16% gravity. Um, that said, living on the moon is the only way we're going to add a third data point to this. And that's very consequential for our hopes of living on Mars. The other problem is the dust, which is this horrible name for it. It's not dust. Dust is something fluffy. We should be calling this, you know, microscopic razor blades because that's what they are. I mean, this stuff is worse than asbestos. This will cut through your lungs. This will cut through your cells. Uh, it's incredibly deadly and it's everywhere on the moon. It's menacing. It actually levitates. It floats about 30 centimeters above the surface of the moon in these electrostatic fountains. And so you just pick it up everywhere you go. Then you bring it back into the habitat and, and breathe it in. It's a horrible situation. In fact, the last man to work to, to, to date to walk on the moon, Eugene Cernan, said that, you know, dust might be like the one thing we can't overcome on the moon. It's just so menacing. Um, okay, but that was a bit doom and gloom. So some more fun, more positive things. I think the best way to get around on the moon, I would love to see more people talking about this, is the gondolas. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, you're above the dust, which is a great thing. But these things can fly across the moon because there's no air resistance, right? And the gravity is low. And there, it'd be easier to build in roads. Uh, you know, the buggies you know, would need roads because it's, it's a pretty tough going over the lunar surface. You've seen the Apollo images. But these things, you just need a couple poles and some uh, cables. So this could be our major uh, way of, of getting across the moon better than roads. Um, I think living in, in lava tubes would be a really neat idea. If we gravitate away from the poles where we have to worry about this incredible temperature fluctuation, one way to deal with this is to essentially live in these lava tubes, which are like caves on Earth. You know how caves have kind of a constant but kind of cold temperature. Uh, it would be pretty cold in these, of course, minus 20 Celsius, but that's very manageable because it's constant. And, and some of these things are massive. They're like the size of a stadium. And you just have to seal it over and you got your ready-made habitat. And maybe you could come, you would have to live down there most of the time, but two weeks of the month in the dawn and the dusk, you could get out and do your activities and then get back in there and, and uh, shelter in place, so to speak, and do some other kinds of work. But that would be the easiest in many ways to live outside of the polar region. And I think that lunar hotels are definitely in our future. It's really just a matter of the ticket price. Um, if, if we can get ticket prices, a rocket price down to a half a million dollars, incredibly expensive, of course, but maybe a hundred thousand dollars, this would be the trip of a lifetime. You know, I think there would be a major market for this, people saving up to have a couple weeks on the moon. And that would be a lot of fun. You know, Baron Hilton thought of this uh, in 1967. Some people called him visionary. Some people called him naive. <laughs> Maybe the, a bit of the latter. He had kind of a perverse uh, sense of what Saturn would look like <laughs> looking at, at the, uh, the window of the bar. I don't think it's going to be that big Saturn. But um, and as he was thinking along these lines, and it's really, you could have really a lot of fun. You can imagine in a pressurized resort uh, in low gravity, you could be doing flips. You could throw your friend across the, <laughs> the room. I mean, you would have incredible strength and it would just be a lot of fun for a couple of weeks and then come back. I think that's definitely in our future. But, you know, this idea of cities on the moon, I just don't see how this can happen. You know, it goes back to the economic and emotional motivation. I, you have thousands of people working on the moon like they do in Antarctica if the mining operations can go. But why would you live there permanently in this kind of gray, stark environment where you're always indoors, can't bring the kids along because they can't possibly grow up in 16% in uh, gravity? I just don't see how cities can happen. Maybe you have ideas, but there's that we, we, just because we can do it doesn't mean people are going to migrate there in the tens of thousands to live in such an environment. Again, a bit like being on top of Mount Everest, regardless of the view. But Mars is different, isn't it? Mars is a place where we feel we actually could live there in, in, in large numbers and raise children there. It has every element we, we need and it has you know, an, an environment that's very much like Earth. So it's very tempting. 
In fact, I think it will be easier to live there than get there. Right? That's the main problem right now. It's getting there because it's a six to nine month trip. And, you know, you have the radiation issue uh, that you're just bathing in radiation, radiation all the way there. You've got the solar radiation, which you can protect against because it's not that energetic to some degree. But then the cosmic radiation is really the menacing stuff. Uh, um, so, I mean, the best estimate for um, these astronauts going there for a two year round trip is like 100 REMS, which is a whole lifetime of radiation. They have to be protected in some way. In fact, the Apollo astronauts, they all reported seeing sparks, seeing flashes in their eyes at a rate of like one every couple of minutes. What these flashes were, were cosmic rays, cosmic radiation going through their eyeball and literally creating sparks, you know? And if that's going through your eyes, like, you know, once every couple of minutes, imagine what it's doing in your body. You're getting bombarded each and every second with these cosmic rays. These are, these, it's, it's radiation. These are atomic particles from deep space, from across the galaxy, from star explosions. And they go into your body and they, and they tear apart your DNA. They tear apart all types of molecules. They break it apart, causing mutations. There's going to be a great need for massive uh, protection. And one way to do this that's come on recently about the past 10 or 15 years is this boron nitride nanotubes. I, it was very promising. They're lightweight. You can see it's kind of fluffy and it can be like insulation for the spacecraft, insulation for the space suit for extra protection that you can wear. Um, and you can even make these into macro structures as well and have it, they're lightweight yet sturdy and you can support the spacecraft with these, uh, these tubes and you could fill it up with hydrogen or water for even more protection. So very promising. I think we got the radiation situation um, at, uh, in hand. The other problem is the gravity issue, which is also easy to solve. Well, NASA doesn't want to do it for some reason. NASA wants to send astronauts to Mars in zero gravity, which I just think, I mean, it's tantamount to murder. I mean, why are you doing this? Um, I mean, this is what an astronaut looks like when she's on the ISS for nine months. You know, she has to be carried out of the spacecraft. Who's going to carry her out on Mars? You know, that's what happens with zero gravity, regardless of your exercise regime, which is what NASA is relying on. That's insane. I know it's going to add money to a mission, but what you need is like an artificial gravity situation. And one of the most inexpensive ways I can do it, aside from these ornate um, uh, spacecraft that you have to build in space, is a spacecraft you would build on Earth, but in orbit, it separates. Maybe you have a cargo side and a people side, but it's connected by a tether. It could be up to like a kilometer long. And then you fire the engines, and then you send one side over the other. So you essentially go to Mars rotating like that all the way over one turning over the other all the way to mars and you could create your own sense of gravity in that regard you could set it at earth's 1g or you could set it at mars is uh slowly get it down to a a 0.38 uh to what mars would be like to acclimate the astronauts on the on the way it's um very straightforward to do Oh, right, we don't know how to land on Mars. So that's a big problem we have to overcome. The heaviest thing we have ever landed was about a ton. And now we're talking about landing humans with 20 or 30 tons. Dicey uh, proposition. Uh, Elon Musk wants to send these things that are 100 tons. Good luck with that. Um, lots of ways to get to Mars. I think this is incredibly cool. I don't know if you can see the cursor, um, but you know, the Elon Musk idea is just to send, you know, thousands of ships each carrying 100 people to populate Mars. If we want to really get a lot of people to Mars, that's what I'm talking about now, not just the first people. Uh, but what you can do instead is have these ships that never land on Earth, never land on Mars. They're essentially shuttles that are going back and forth in this orbit around the sun, this interesting orbit that takes it closer to Earth and closer to Mars, closer to Earth, closer to Mars, over and over again. It's a free tra trajectory. Once you get that in orbit, you don't need any more energy to keep it going. So when you're a shuttle, you could have maybe 10 of them all lined up. When they get close to uh, Earth at the right time, you hop on it from Earth, you jump up there, you can load up hundreds of people, and then it takes about five months to get to Mars. And then everyone hops off. The shuttle, this is important, goes back empty 
because at this point, the planets have kind of separated and they are opposite eyes, sides of the sun. So it's going to take about two years for this thing to get back. But once it gets back, a whole bunch of more people hop up again and, and take that five months to Mars and hop off. You could have several of these things going at the same time, as I said, and that's how you could get the masses to Mars in, in these ships that never land. They could be very big ships because they never have to take off from Earth or land on Mars. You don't have to worry about that weight issue. Um, let's move forward. Okay, so here's, we're on Mars and here's the problem. It's beautiful, right? <laughs> and that's a problem because it looks tameable. You know, it looks like the outback or um, uh, America, but you know, the devil's in the details here, isn't it? There's all these serious problems we just kind of gloss over that we really have to address. One is the pressure suit. You know, the pressure is only point, it's, it's only six millibars on earth at sea level, we're at a thousand. So at six millibars, um, that's essentially like the moon's zero millibars. You know, in all these future scenarios, everyone's in these kind of reasonable pressure suits, you know, they don't look bad. Look, I, look, looks like this guy's out for a hike. Doesn't look like so, not so bad, you could do that. This is an MI, this is one designed by MIT. It's been in development for about 10 or 15 years. Still doesn't work. Looks great, yeah. <laughs> but you'd die if you'd be wearing that on, on Mars. You'll be in one of these bulky um, moon suits unless we come up with a, some new solution. And that takes a lot of the fun of being on Mars. It, it's not so easy when you're, you know, bouncing around in one of these big suits that pick up your objects and explore the planet. You know, we have this idea that we're exploring out there just like it's Earth, but it's not that way. Um, and then there's um, the dust problem. You know, there's these dust storms. So whose job is it to clean these beautiful domes? All these domes always look very pristine, but it's going to be dusty as all hell. I mean, one of the, uh, the rovers uh, died because it got covered with too much uh, dust. And, you know, it's one thing cleaning it, but the problem is some of these dust storms last a long time, right? A month, three months, a year. This is what we've only recorded in the recent history of Mars. So what happens to these trees in these domes <laughs> after a couple months of no sunlight? They're all going to die. It's, it's, it's not as easy as it looks in these kind of pictures. And then again, the gravity issue. If 38% if gravity is not enough to reproduce and raise children, then that game over for colonization, right? <laughs> It'll just be kind of an adults only place on Mars because if you can't raise children, then you can't really settle on Mars. And that's a big open-ended question. That's why I do think it's very important to go to the moon to at least learn on that chart. Remember, where does, where does 0.16 gravity come in um, on that chart? It might give you a sense of what uh, 0.38 is going to be. Um, I'll wrap up here. There's a couple fun ways to live on Mars. Um, a lot of them involve, you know, being underground or in some contained dark situation because of the radiation. This one's a little better. This is an inflatable habitat, which is kind of neat. And um, you would have to cover it with regolith to protect against the radiation, the soil there. Uh, but you need a lot of it, like three meters worth to protect against the radiation. Um, but this concept is kind of a, there's a membrane in here. You would fill it with Martian water or Martian ice. And ice and water, they're, they're denser than the regolith. So you could have more protection for less volume. So that's kind of cool. You still wouldn't be able to see out of it. And that's a big issue. Why go to Mars and live in something that you, and you can't even see the planet most of the time? So my idea is to like cut in to the side of a hill, you know, like the northern slope uh, in the northern hemisphere. So the sun is behind you. That means you're blocking out 100% of the solar radiation and the planet itself is blocking out all the cosmic radiation from below, behind, and above. So you would only have a little bit of cosmic radiation coming through the front. And my, my suggestion is do this and have a massive window so you can be on Mars and actually see Mars and not be underground. Who, how can you attract thousands of people to be living on Mars just to go underground? So I think that would be a cool way to go about this. Air, there's lots of ways to breathe on Mars. There's no air, no oxygen to speak of, but we can convert it. And there's a mission, there's a instrument heading there now called MOXIE. 
that's going to do a, a very simple experiment by converting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to carbon monoxide and oxygen gas. That'll be the major way to generate oxygen. But you can also do it with plants. And I visited this facility at the University of Arizona. This is a lightweight uh, grow uh, apparatus and it's collapsible. Um, these are all aluminum frames with some plastic. It's only about a couple hundred pounds. I mean, I was able to, to lift it a little bit. Um, but what's fascinating is they can grow a thousand kilocalories. They can harvest a thousand kilocalories of food each day. And more important for this discussion, they could generate 100% of the oxygen needs for any adult. So imagine being on Mars and everyone gets one of these things. You know, you have all your oxygen and a good like half or a third of your calories. Uh, that's just a really neat idea. And again, lightweight and collapsible, you can send it in, in your spaceship. You would want redundancy, of course, in case the plants die and you're out of oxygen, but uh, nonetheless, this is a good start. Because farming is gonna be pretty hard. <laughs> that's one other thing that's gonna be difficult. A Mark Watney in, in the, uh, in the movie, The Martian, he was able to grow potatoes in the dirt, but if he ate them, he would have died because <laughs> the dirt is toxic. The dirt contains perchlorates, and that would have caused some major thyroid issues for him. Uh, the writers, uh, Andy Weir, did not realize how uh, toxic the soil was. That kind of discovery came a little bit later. Um, and, but there's also the, the light issue. The, there's enough natural sunlight on Mars to grow food, absolutely. At the equator, the intensity of the sun is a bit like Scandinavia on Earth. Uh, so that much is okay. But again, it's the dust storm problem. When dust storms come and cover your crops, uh, would block out the sun for a month or so, you're in trouble. So you're going to have to rely on LEDs, which is okay. But you have to realize Mars will be forever dependent on Earth until they can make their own light bulbs. <laughs> Because what happens when the light bulbs burn out, you're gonna to have to get more from Earth. But again, everything's gonna be difficult on Mars. Uh, you have this idea, we just send normal people and uh, they're all set to go. All we need is normal people there. That's what Elon Musk wants to do. But you know, I'm gonna, for the first several decades, you're gonna to have to send some really clever people that really know how to build civilization out of thin air, more or less. But from now to that point, we need major advancements in technology particularly AI, artificial intelligence for these rovers. You know, you, you look at the rovers, they just go in inch by inch, right? Because they're not smart enough to negotiate the terrain as basic as that terrain is. We need, you know, incredible more, incredible advancements so that these robots can be moving around all them, uh, by themselves, exploring and, and building these shelter, shelters we envision uh, all by themselves without needing to be uh, monitored from Earth. Lots of technology needed to get to this point, and I'm wrapping up here, that, you know, this is really cool. I would love to be here, you know, like thousands of people on Mars. But what this represents really is trillions of dollars of Earth investment, okay? So how does that happen? This is unlike any colonization or settlements we've ever experienced before, because it's not old world, new world, and where the new world can trade fur and fish and timber and minerals and, and bring wealth back to the, <laughs> to the, um, the motherland. There, there's nothing of value uh, right now on Mars. So all these people, these thousands of people living on Mars, they're a bunch of moochers, aren't they? <laughs> they're not making any money sending it back. They have to rely on the, tr the taxpayers of the world, of, of Earth, allowing them to live there for decades until maybe at best they can have their own self-contained economy, but still never be giving anything back to Earth. So what economic motivation is it for Earthlings to be sponsoring this? It's really something that has to be worked out until there's something we can get back from Mars that the public would buy into. I don't see how we can have thousands of people there. That's just my take. Um, Terraforming, I would love to talk about that in depth. It's physically possible without magic. I think I say, you know, some things are just kind of engineering magic, oh, we can do this. But, you know, the premise is simple. I mean, if you heat the planet and there are non-magic ways to do that, you could liberate all the dry ice uh, from below your feet, get it above your head to create some type of atmospheric pressure. And if we can raise that pressure from six millibar to about 150, 
Then you could run around naked on Mars. Okay, how's that for a visual for you? You would need your pressurized suit if we can get up to 150. You have to be breathing 100% oxygen because your lungs wouldn't be able to function that low. On Earth, we're at 1,000. Mount Everest is around 500 millibar. But uh, we could function without the, uh, the suit. But the problem is that recent analysis has shown that is maybe if you liberate every little drop of uh, dry ice and put it up in the sky, you're only talking about 100 millibar. And that's a shame. Uh, I don't know where the extra pressure is going to come from. You know, one fantastic idea is you get an asteroid and you skim it across the atmosphere of Mars and release all the volatiles there. Again, you know, yes, you can do it. It's a bit like magic, but uh, you can go for that. But that's the only way to fully habita uh, terraform Mars. Uh, that said, at 100 millibar, you can still have plant life and things like that. So this, I'm open to any type of discussion. This is be a second half of a talk that I would give about, there's ways again to live on every planet if you, if you can come up with a reason. I mean, you could be on Mercury because it actually fluctuates between hot and cold depending as, as it's rotating around the sun. There's a night, day and a, a night and a day, but you can only, you could travel to only three and a half kilometers per hour. And if you can do that constantly moving, you can stay at dusk or dawn, you can stay on that terminator line between night and day, where it's a comfortable temperature, and you can live on Mercury, if you can come up with a reason. <laughs> uh, again, you can live on in the atmosphere of Venus um, at incredible luxury. This, you would have normal gravity, you would have normal pressure, as far as we're concerned, and it would be 50 degrees Celsius, which is like a bad day on the outback, but you know, it's, it's something we could manage. Um, if you could have a reason to be out there, maybe, maybe to investigate life. You can ice fish on Europa in case there's a, um, a, you know, some type of life discovered in that subsurface ocean. Or uh, in, in Celadus, which I think is actually a greater candidate for the possibility of life, because they have uh, geothermic vents, which on Earth serve as food for things that don't see any sunlight. That's really exciting. Um, Titan, uh, people talk about how living on Titan would be easier than living on the moon because there's an atmosphere on Titan. I think they're, they're daft. Uh, I mean, yes, you don't need your pressurized suit, but you know, what are you gonna wear to protect yourself from the minus 180 degrees Celsius? You might as well be in a damn pressurized suit on Mars. Um, mind blowing a concept, you could tether uh, Pluto to its moon, Charon, because they're tidally locked to each other. The moon is locked to us, but we're not locked to the moon. So the moon's kind of always showing the same face, but around the whole earth. But um, these two always show the same face to each other. So you could attach it with a tether and it's only 19,000 kilometers. So we have, I mean, Kevlar can handle this. And then you could live in between there on these rotating habitats and then go down to the planet uh, to visit or work, you know, it's always this crazy idea in the future, we're going to be working as miners and farmers. We go back to the most primitive occupations in the future. But, you know, a lot of these scenarios, and this is new, the next to the last slide, it, it, they fall apart because of this concept that um, Isaac Asimov introduced, terrestrial chauvinism. Why do we have this desire to live on the rock, you know, to live on these planets, on these moons, when you could be living above them in relative lecture, uh, luxury. I mean, that's, that's the probable thing that will happen. I mean, you could have rotating habitats like we want in low earth orbit with, with artificial gravity and climate control. I mean, look at this one. It has, it has patio furniture for Christ's sake. <laughs> we have to be here above Titan <laughs> and then maybe go down to Titan to visit and explore because it's fascinating and then get back home to some place that's reasonable to live. Why live on these rocks? It's just not practical. Again, why live on top of Mount Everest? Beautiful to see, but just not practical to live. So I'm gonna bring us back uh, to Earth now um, from the perspective of the moon, which is a neat perspective because when you live on the moon, you can always see Earth. And that's rather comforting. And no immigrant has ever had that experience, really. You know, our, the colonists in Australia and, and uh, the Americas, they couldn't look back to see Europe or, or England. You know, you wouldn't be able to see the motherland. 
but anyone going to uh, the moon would always be able to go back and see the motherland. Um, but what's really cool, perhaps uh, from the Australian point of view, is that if you're on the South Pole of the moon, where is where we're going to be, and you look back at the Earth, gets what's the top of the world. Australia will be at the top of the world when you look back. And uh, maybe like many of you think it already is. <laughs> and, uh, so with that last pandering to the audience, I will uh, gladly take questions for as, as long as you can stand me. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, but if you do have a few questions, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll chip through. Um, there's a question here from Vienna. Uh, what chemical and physical properties of the boron tubes uh, make it suitable for the radiation shield you mentioned earlier? Yes. It's, um, I'm going to try to unshare. Am I... Am I still showing my screen? You are. Just yeah. stop sharing. Yeah, that should be that. Yeah. Perfect. How do I stop sharing? Uh, there should be like a little red stop sharing. Uh, I've just stopped it remotely. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please do. Okay, so um, it is fascinating how this works because normally radiation protection requires a lot of weight you know, like a lead apron when you go to the dentist's office to protect you from an x-ray there. Um, but the boron, for reasons I, I don't know exactly, is it's a good absorber of secondary cosmic rays. So again, these cosmic rays, can you hear me? I'm kind of frozen here. No, we got you. Okay, you can at least hear me. Okay, because I can't see you at the moment, um, which is very disorienting. But um, okay, at least I can see Peter now. Okay, um, so when these cosmic rays, again, they're like, they're, they're, they're atomic particles. So they collide with the spacecraft, right? And then they create all these secondary particles. They're shrapnel, essentially. That's what makes cosmic rays particularly deadly. The, the solar radiation isn't doing that. They're not strong enough. They're like uh, electrons and hydrogen uh, nuclei. Um, but these are like iron and, and such from deep in the galaxy. So they hit the spacecraft, create this shrapnel effect of all these other particles, um, which is exactly what's happening in our upper atmosphere um, when they collide with that. Um, and the boron, for reasons of physics I don't understand, is a particularly good absorber of those secondary radiation. And when you combine that, um, if you can form it into a, a macro tube and then combine it with water, which you need to bring to Mars anyway, uh, which is useful to you on the trip, or hydrogen gas, which is very lightweight, um, that actually increases the absorption of these secondary cosmic ray particles. But the actual physics of it, I don't understand. Fantastic. Um, another question from Ross. Uh, with regarding terraforming on Mars, how do we stop the gases that we introduce to Mars from escaping the, the low gravity of Mars? Um, Yes, it's my understanding that uh, they can stay there for tens of thousands of years. So when we talk about the gases escaping from Mars over the eons, this is happening over the course of millions of years, accelerated by the um, solar radiation pushing things away as well. But it's, it's, I'm, I'm told, I don't know how these calculations are made, that um, that process takes so long. So if we begin to terrorize, uh, terrorize, whoops, terrorize. To terraform Mars, um, then um, we're good to go for, for about 10,000 years. And that might be enough pocket change to uh, come up with grand, grander ideas 10,000 years from now on how to self-contain uh, some of that atmosphere. Yeah. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, the way you start the book up, actually, is essentially laying out kind of three reasons why we'd be, we'd be doing, or what, why exploration or space exploration um, has happened and, and the motivations behind them. And, and uh, I'll sort of paraphrase you. One would be for military advantage, uh, mm -hmm. another for praise or glory of a leader or dictator, and mm -hmm. the other one for economic reasons and right and i think what you've said tonight and, and in the book you know we've got to try and work out which one of those is practical and reasonable and sustainable um, right. um and i think like when i point back to my presentation about the 
political situation in the US, it seems That's like right. Trump is, or the powers mm -hmm. of be are painting China yeah. as being the military driver to do what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's, a no, that's exactly it. pretty... tapping into a sense of patriotism and China's making great advancements, you know, and they're human beings and they should be lauded for what they're doing. I mean, they've had two space stations already and they're building a third and they're the ones that can get humans up into <laughs> low earth orbit. The United States didn't regain that capacity to uh, just a few months ago. Um, that said, yeah, we can, that is a good driver to start getting into space, but it doesn't last very long. Um, that was the problem really with the space race. And people say that was a good thing because it got us into space. That's one way to look at it, but it was very narrow-minded. We just had to get someone on the moon and we never, we failed to create any type of infrastructure or any sense that we were going to stay there for a long term. And what would have happened without the space race, we don't know. But back in the 1950s, there was discussion about this international co uh, collaboration of starting to get into space with communication satellites and things like that. It was the Russians who threw down the gauntlet uh, with their Sputnik and the US had to challenge that. And it went off in a different direction. But I think that we would have had this natural progression without the space race of first getting into low earth orbit and then gradually building out to the moon, not going to the moon first <laughs> and then backtracking and then, okay, now what are we going to do? That's yeah. where we're at now. So if we follow this impulse to just challenge China, I think we're going to do silly things. We're going to spend a lot of money on things that are just not practical for long-term habitation in space. Well, that's right. And, and to an economic reason to stay. Trying to find that economic reason. And I think you pointed to it and I think you make reference to in the book that, um, you know, about on the moon, for example, you know, at some stage, if a business is able to generate liquid water or hydrogen oxygen from moon resources and mm -hmm. sell it to the, to the expeditioners or the, or the miners or the explorers, that's, right. that's going to be the, the way to move forward. Yeah. Yes. United Launch Alliance has already put a price on it at five, I think it's $500 a kilogram. And they're going to need, I think, a thousand metric tons. So I did the math earlier. That's like a billion dollars worth of fuel that they're willing to buy on the moon. Um, and NASA is going to need a fair share of that as well. They're, that way you don't have to carry your fuel to the moon, which has been a major problem even going to Mars. You carry all your fuel to get back. Uh, so the way you can just, just enough fuel to get you to the moon and then rely on the fuel there to go to the next step. That's a billion dollar business right there. Mm. Absolutely. I'm um, just looking for some other questions here. Um, oh, how will mining leases on the moon? Well, how, how will mining leases be governed? Do you think? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a, a tricky question. Um, it depends how people are interpreting the, um, the uh, space treaty. There is a space treaty and there is something called a moon treaty. The space treaty was the original one. And that's a bit like Antarctica that no one can own the moon. Um, the moon treaty is trying to go a step further that anything you, it's only the moon treaty has only been signed by countries who don't have space programs right now. <laughs> um, so that, that moon treaty is stating that anything we take from the moon any profits have to be spread out across the whole globe because it's for everyone, not for any given nation. The space treaty has some wiggle room. And right now, it, you can't own it, but uh, you can't own any land, but that doesn't mean you can't take any resources from it. And the Obama administration actually did some, create something in, I think, 2015 uh, that would, in, and so did Luxembourg, um, that would enable you to uh, profit from uh, materials on the moon and asteroids. And I thought that was curious about asteroid, asteroids where, yes, you might not be able to own that asteroid, but you can mine every last crumb of it <laughs> until it's completely gone and profit from that, um, but never own it. Um, but there's going to be some discussions in world courts about, uh, yeah, the, the, the rights uh, of who has the right to be where on the moon. It's a big planet, but there are 
places that are better than others. Remember those craters I spoke about, the top of craters where there has perpetual sunlight, that's valuable real estate. Whoever gets there first is going to get that. <laughs> and whoever gets there second is going to get a less uh, opportunistic place to put their solar panels. Mm. So I don't know how that's going to be worked out. No one does. We, when, back in when this law was created, uh, this treaty was uh, signed, there wasn't really much talk about it, but it has to be discussed now. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, just wondering if there's another question to come in. Chris, do you have a sense of, um, of, of what the direction going forward with either of the, uh, the two candidates in the upcoming election might be? Do you, do you, yeah. Would um, you like to share those or? <laughs> yeah, no, I will. Um, you know, so with you were spot, I mean, you, you, you nailed everything you said was absolutely correct from my perspective. Um, and you know, so the, the current president, Trump, he, he, he says a lot of things. What he wants is, is a mystery, but he tries to you know, appeal to his base. And this idea is very patriotic that we're going to go back to the moon and we're going to go to Mars. And he wants to create his legacy in that regard and, and then create the Space Force, which is kind of needed, but maybe not yet. Um, that it's what I was saying earlier. That's a fine idea if you do it appropriately, but I think he's going to be pushing for this to be done inappropriately, not in a way that's step-by-step -step sustainable, but to be rushing back to this impossible deadline of 2024, wasting a lot of money um, to do so. Whereas um, on the flip side, Biden is a bit boring, right? Um, and he doesn't excite anybody about space because he doesn't have much of a space agenda at all. I think that's fine, because as I said, the less political motivation for human spaceflight, the better. Uh, because once politics get into it, it becomes very expensive in the United States because these programs, in, in a very cynical way, they're not about exploring space, they're about providing jobs to various different states in the United States. And, and that's been a problem with the space shuttle and the International Space Station, how these things, parts of it were built in like all across America. And they were assembled here, built here, and it just added incredible costs to the situation. Um, so if there's someone like Biden, if he has less interest in space, all, all the better. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Now, the China situation is serious. It was Obama that, uh, in that era, that signed the Chinese exclusion policy that barred the United States from working with uh, China to a great degree. I, you had stated I was at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. We're not even allowed to host sci Chinese scientists there anymore. It was a great schism because they were accused, and it, you know, it does seem to be very true that they stole a lot of information from contractors in order them to advance their uh, missile technology. Um, I don't know how to mend that. You know, they are a very ambitious country. I'm, a, I'm about human beings. I'm less about governments. The government of China is not as great as it's the people <laughs> that make up that country. And so I'm hesitant to interact with China as well because of these constant stealing of information, the government. And, but Biden might be more willing to interact with them. And I think that has people nervous because uh, he would want to reconnect to China. Fantastic. Uh, all right, Chris, it's getting fairly late here. I'm happy to keep going, but I'm just gonna wrap up a couple of things and then if people wanna stay around, we can keep, keep going if you'd like. So yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna sure. Sun's I'm just gonna, here. Oh, well, congratulations. All right, I'm, I'm just gonna... So, Mike, are you ready to go shortly with what we were doing? Yeah, I'm ready when you are. Right. So, anyway, I'd like to express a great thanks to Chris. It was fantastic for him to put himself out and get up so early and be part of this. I had a couple of discussions with Chris prior to this, and he's really been very, very uh, uh, cooperative and flexible with me, so I really appreciate that. Um, 
Space Fairers is the book that Chris has, has, has written. And, and as I say, I'd urge anyone of the interest in this subject to go out and get a copy because it's fantastic. It's very easy to read. Um, and it's, it's got a, a nice level of detail that us um, space interested slash geeks are into, but it's also not heavy and overbearing and strings of calculations and, and chemical uh, uh, formulas that you just get lost. So uh, it's a really nice, um, a really nice uh, uh, balance between those two. So as we mentioned, we do have a, a, a member draw, a Space Association membership draw. And I think from last checked, I think we've got 23 entries, is that right, Mike? Yeah, about that, yep. Yep. So what's going to happen now is, uh, is uh, Mike is going to share his screen and put the names into a bit of software. Actually, I'll stop sharing mine and he can share his. Um, and we will draw the, the winner for that. Okay, these are the names of the people who have entered the draw. I'll put them uh, in this. You're not sharing, right? Ah, sorry. Okay, so we've put all the names of the people that have entered the draw into this random um, picker. And uh, we're going to give that a burl and um, it will basically go through and, and pick a random name. So let's do that. It doesn't take very long. Has it got a drum, a drum roll feature or not? No, you'll have to, you'll oh, have okay. to make the appropriate sounds yourself. There you go. We need a barrel grill, that's what we need. Uh, and... I can't read that, Mike. That's all right. That's because the winner is Steve Scar. Steve Scar. Fantastic, Steve. All right. All right, Steve, look, that will be in the post to you shortly. Congratulations. That's fantastic. All right, brilliant. Um, all right, Mike, I might take the, Mike, the screen back from you. Sure. And uh, we do have, for those who didn't win a book tonight, we do have for the Space Association and their friends, Wiley Australia, who are handling the distribution of the book here in Australia, have provided us with a discount code. So uh, if you contact Wiley Australia at that email address or that phone number and quote that code, SPA35, we'll put this up on our... Um, on a YouTube channel, or you can send us an email if you, if you don't capture this. Uh, basically, you get a 35% discount, 35 discount on the book, uh, plus shipping, and that'll be available to you until the 31st of October. So um, once again, I would strongly recommend you, uh, you go out and get this book, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, and there's the, uh, the title and the, the uh, book number, I think it is. All right, and then we do have one more giveaway for it, and that's not tonight. As people may or may not know, the Space Association run a weekly radio program called The Space Show. It's on on 88.3 Southern FM here in Melbourne. Uh, it also, if you go to southernfm.com.au, you can listen to it online. Um, Andrew Rennie is the, is the presenter and producer of that show, and he is going to be giving away a copy of the book this coming Wednesday. I'm not sure what time it will be, but uh, just make sure you um, make sure you uh, listen in and uh, and get ready to dial the number that Andrew will give you on the night. And so we have one copy to give away on Andrew's radio show. So uh, um, and if uh, uh, it's a good show to listen to, even if you don't uh, win a prize on that night. So. Um, 
I think, oh, that's right. I think we're just about done. Just wanted to wrap up the evening. Thanks again, everybody. Just wanted to give you a bit of a hint. I think there's a launch. Just give you a, a hint of uh, some of the launches that are scheduled uh, for the balance of September and October for our next meeting. So there's a Falcon Heavy, uh, sorry, Falcon Starlink launch on tonight, 12.22 a.m. Eastern time. Then there's Delta Heavy tomorrow uh, at 2 p.m., 2.02. Uh, there's a Momo flight from Japan and another Falcon 9 going up from uh, Cape Canaveral on the 30th. And Terry's, the Cygnus uh, mission's going up, which I think is named for the SS, uh, for Kap Kapana Chawa, the Indian born astronaut that, uh, that died on the, uh, on the um, Columbia uh, accident. Then there's a Soyuz on the 14th of October, another Soyuz on the 15th, then Electron over New, New Zealand on the 15th, around midnight. Actually, I think, is that one going off from, oh yeah, it's going from New Zealand, yeah. Um, there's an Atlas on the 15th in the States, another Soyuz, et cetera, et cetera. So that's pretty much it. So I've got a picture of this contraption here, which is the ISS. Our next meeting is on Monday the 26th. And what we're going to be doing, it's going to be 20 years of the occupation of the ISS in October. So we're going to be doing a bit of a, a presentation on that. So that is the finish of the official part of the meeting. And once again, I would, I know that Josh is still here. I would sincerely like to thank uh, Josh Keegan for, for putting all that work in and, and participating. It was really good to have Josh. And of course, Christopher, fantastic from, from Baltimore. Um, if you want to unmute your mics and have a chat or ask a question, let's uh, go free range if you'd like. Oh, I got this more questions over there. Because people were asking about signed copies. I just don't know how to pull that yeah. off. It's not yeah, so I, I don't I, sell the book myself. It's with a, a publisher, Harvard University Press. And yeah. I know you tried to arrange that, of course, Peter. Uh, but we're all, all the way over here in the United States. I would, I would have to get a carton of books, which is possible, and then start mailing them to people. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's, I, it's very I, hard. Well, as 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 Chris mentioned, I did I did make inquiry with the pu with the publisher for for one of our members here. So they were, I don't know whether Julian they've come back to you with anything yet. No, she didn't. Come no, back to me. no, they they haven't come back to me as yet. No, right. Okay. And uh, I'm in Baltimore. Someone just asked where I'm at. Baltimore is uh, near Washington D.C. in between Washington and Philadelphia on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, that's pretty tough these days, isn't it? I, don't, uh, I think with COVID, it doesn't make it any easier either. Well, that's no, we have know. one post office that we have access to, unfortunately, at this point. Um, limited hours. Comes and goes. I don't know what the fall is going to bring. There's a question of was here how, from Paul Howard. How do you see tourism on the moon ever happening uh, as, as a prospect? What, what on the moon? How could I see Tourism. That? Tourism. Well, I think you talked a bit about tourism, but yeah. how do you sort of see it working? Um, well, I think in the beginning, um, I think, again, going back to the Antarctica um, example, you know, it's step by step how we established science base. What's fascinating about Antarctica, I'll, I'll quickly say, is that we were first there in the year 1900, and it took 50 years before we could be there permanently in Antarctica, technology improved. And the same thing's happening on the moon. 1969, we touched down. 50 years later, we're talking about permanency. And so we're back on Antarctica. We're in Antarctica in a permanent kind of way. And now tourists are frequently going down there at, a, at quite an expense, but they're able to get there in, on the perimeter um, in, in conjunction with some of these science bases. And I think that would be happening on the moon, the most logical place to go, again, because of the ease would be the, the lunar south pole, that um, maybe in the same way that the ISS 
has opened up to six or seven space tourists. That's a, a euphemism for really wealthy uh, thrill uh, seekers. Um, but in the same way that that has opened up to tourism, I think the first tourism might be at the actual science bases on the uh, moon in the lunar south pole for several million dollars you might be able to get your uh, chance to go to one of them um, but again as things get easier on the moon uh, you could set up your basic I mean we call it a hotel but it's going to be some igloo hut <laughs> uh, with minimal accommodations the thrill being on the moon itself uh, down on the south pole just a matter of the cost of getting there. And as I mentioned, as half a million dollars would be huge interest in it. It'll be a slow buildup, of course. Uh, but I think as prices come down, more and more people will be able to do this and the resorts would be more and more elaborate. I would love for it to be, you know, what would you do there? You'd be on the moon, you know, but if we were able to have resorts near the Apollo sites, <laughs> They yeah, could right. actually be nat natural park, national parks <laughs> uh, on the moon. Uh, that gets up a bit of what you said about um, rights. Who owns those things? Who's to say that China can't go in and uh, set up a shop right near the Apollo site? And then you have to worry about people touching things. So there might be some, uh, some issues coming up in the future with tourists and what they're going to be doing on the moon. Yeah, for sure. Uh, as a question comes through here, how do you see the weaponization and militarization of space progressing? Do you think that's going to... Yeah, that's a bit dark, uh, but serious. I have to side with this concept that we're going to need some protections up there um, because four countries now have demonstrated that they could blow things up in space, right? First, United States and Russia, China, blew up its own satellite um, a couple years ago, uh, which is a tremendous problem because it was actually a decade ago now because they just produced a bunch of space junk. And now India has even done that. So from Earth, they sent up a missile to blow up their own satellite. They're doing this to demonstrate that they can blow up anybody's satellite. So what do you do about that? And because if you blow up a communication satellite, that's like the quote you said, there was an opinion piece talking about a Pearl Harbor situation. Um, if some enemy of the states blew up all our military communication satellites, we wouldn't be able to retaliate because we depend on those satellites to launch, <laughs> to destroy their satellites. So it's a matter of who strikes first. And I think there's going to be a militarization in space. Yes, um, this is just human nature. It's pathetic, uh, but I don't see any way of stopping it. Uh, as optimistic as I am about humanity, I think we're gonna start building things in space to protect our assets in space. And it's gonna be a complicated, ugly situation. Mm. Sorry uh, to report, that's what I said. Yeah. Somebody's uh, just said they've gone to the Wiley website about the book and they can't find it there. Um, leave that with us. I'll get in touch with the publisher and we'll, we'll make sure that uh, we um, get that uh, out to you. Thanks. See you. We, we can capture this chat, right, Mike? Yes, we can. We, we, we okay, can. So, um, right, um, maybe we'll put it, we'll, actually, we might put it back on our the event website mike because then then people we can point people back there because that's obviously how they got to this uh, event tonight anyway yeah fantastic brilliant um i've got a question for um christopher perhaps um i was watching some um shows recently where they suggest that they would leave from the moon to get to Mars. What are your thoughts on that kind of strategy? I think it's even been suggested loosely that would be the way they would get to Mars for like NASA in the future as well. Whether that's feasible, it seems difficult. I, I would agree that that's very promising, um, especially on where we're at in our uh, development. I think the very first voyages to Mars will be from Earth because it's just a little bit more practical. But if we're going to do it a lot, that would be the logical place, for, uh, in my opinion, to start doing that because of how 
especially if you can build on the moon. Um, and spacecraft in many ways are incredibly simple, the outer shell, it's the, the guts of it that are the tricky part as you guys are experiencing with your launch. Um, so if that kind of stuff could be made on earth and transported to the moon, and then the shell of the spacecraft essentially be made on the moon and assembled on the moon, uh, you could be taking off from the moon. And one idea I like about taking off from the moon is that we can bring back nuclear option into the equation. You know, back in the, there was a secret program in the 50s and the 60s in the United States led by Freeman Dyson, a brilliant individual. They wanted to send a nuclear rocket to Mars. Uh, it would get there in about two weeks <laughs> the incredible G-forces propelled by 20,000 nuclear bombs something that only the United States could envision. Um, but but uh, believe it or not, that was kind of risky. And uh, so the problem was, uh, I mean, this, the program was uh, shuttered. But you could do that from the moon because you don't have to worry about the risk of any type of nuclear fallout on top of another country. And that could be a tremendous advantage because nuclear power, a nuclear powered spacecraft could get you to Mars rather quickly so fast that you would have to worry about the G-forces uh, doing so, like 100 to 10 to 100 uh, forces of gravity against your chest all the way there. You would have to actually purposely slow down. Um, that's how powerful nuclear is. So that's why I like the moon, because of that nuclear option. Um, Could I pick okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Sorry, Peter, can you hear yes. me? Yes. Oh, good day. And I'd just like to uh, mention to Mr. Wanchek, uh, hopefully I pronounce his name properly, and thanks for the talk. Yeah, of but uh, you, you gave a few interesting insights. One thing that I liked, while there was an expense associated with free enterprise, you had uh, various parties across the US contributing to the American space program. Costly as it might be as an overburden, it did show uh, some sentiments towards overall cooperation. Now, I feel that human, the human community will get to the moon or get to Mars, etc., etc., because it's part of the human psyche. Right now, if we're looking for military motivation, it is a plastic motivation, like the space race leading to the landing on the moon, etc., etc. But I feel that we will come to a realization that true space exploration and space endeavors will have to be a thorough cooperation. China, Japan, Russia, America, New Zealand, maybe even Australia and Europe, and also. Saudi Arabia. So that's what we've got to look forward to, right? Getting over all these hassles. And unfortunately, the practical situation of today with the pandemic, one community can't somehow cooperate properly, sufficiently enough to get over this current handicap. So we've got a lot to learn, right? But the real benefit of uh, decent exploration of close space and further out space towards Mars will have to depend on international cooperation, not militarization, but an agreement for cooperation. Oh, oh absolutely. And I could only wish that we um, could stand by our agreements. Now, I can give you two great examples, again, with um, Antarctica, we're living and working in peace down there, you know, and there's really very little conflict down there and one base is helping out the other. Uh, and that's some good examples to build upon. And in terms of space science, I mean, there was an extraordinary mission, the Cassini mission that brought a NASA probe to Saturn and, yeah. and took all those amazing images that also delivered an ESA probe that landed, landed on the moon of Titan and, and was active for like a couple hours. 
we actually, ESA, through NASA and that cooperation, landed something so far away. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was amazingly promising. I'm worried about these long-term agreements because, again, I said that, you know, maybe the ISS isn't necessary, but NASA has kind of dragged other nations into this thing and now is talking about abandoning it. That's tough, you know, and, you know, the way the politics are set up, you know, you have one administration reneging on the, uh, the promises of a previous one. I mean, look outside of space, look at the Paris Accord and what the United States is doing yeah. or various missile treaties that we pull out of. That's troublesome to me that you have, we in, <clears throat> enlist the help of all these other nations to uh, do this expensive work in space and then pull out of the deal. Uh, I don't know how to get around that. You're very practical and uh, you know, some of the things that we still have to learn about a decent step into space, right? Mm. We have to go to a very, very practical college, okay? Mm. Now, my feeling is that the International Space Station is that initial step to a, an environmental learning area about what it means to experience space, right? Mm -hmm. Now, being of the generation of Apollo, of Star Trek, of uh, Space Odyssey, like a lot of us mm -hmm. may be, right? Mm -hmm. I noticed that... Old. You know how... Uh, <laughs> how Guilty. It, there's not been a set of, of Star Trek that I can recall where the Enterprise landed on any planet, right? So maybe we have to take the next initial step with international cooperation of building a mothership mm. that basically orbits around the Earth and then can go to the space station or can send shuttles to the space station or travel to the moon and mm. orbit the moon and come back. So like you described the, the uh, journey to Mars, you know, in that two-year cycle, et cetera, et cetera, if you had a mothership, mm. the people actually, like the equivalent of a, a major aircraft carrier here on Earth, right? Yeah. Where the personnel on the aircraft carrier stay there for six months, you know? Mm. So therefore, they get acclimatized to a, a constrained environment. Something like this, on a USS Enterprise orbiting and being a mothership between the Earth and the Moon, or even uh, in Star Wars, building a uh, Death Star. Oh, uh, so, I mean, fantastic. Yeah, but like the fact that the accommodations, the, the resources, the Enterprise, and the, you know, the production that can happen on those, right, including the studies, these will be something that you need to make the connection between Earth proper and a fledgling base on the moon, and then subsequently a fledgling base on Mars. Right? I've got a, yeah, I've got a, I've got a question here from Kate, uh, Chris. Uh, what are your thoughts on the suggestions to set up nuclear explosions on Mars as part of a terraforming process? Yeah, um, I think there are other ways to heat up the planet. <laughs> um, you hate to destroy any life that was clinging underneath the surface. So I don't know how to uh, control that. You may, you know, be destroying the very precious thing that we want to study once yeah. we get there. That's the problem with the, the nukes on, on Mars. I mean, let's just take our time. We don't really have to do this in a couple of years. We can slowly warm up the planet by, uh, I mean, we're good at warming up our own planet. So if we can start burning some, um, there are ideas of, 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 of burning chlorofluorocarbons uh, that were on Mars. You could, you could um, manufacture some of these things that contain fluoride, fluorine and, and chlorine, and they're very potent uh, uh, greenhouse gases. And they could, you could just have a factory set up to release them. They're more potent than methane and, and other things that we have on Earth. Uh, and that could greatly, uh, greatly, I mean, it could significantly warm the planet by a couple degrees and start melting things. I think it would be just too 
disastrous to, to blow things up as bright or smart as we think we can do it uh, carefully. I don't think we'll ever pull that off. Same as the asteroid idea. I mean, why don't we ram an asteroid into it? <laughs> that would take care of it. What could and, possibly uh, go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, but if there's any life there, you know, no, yeah. that would be it would yeah. be a shame. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the things I meant to speak uh, mentioned Chris about your book I really liked is and something that I hadn't really thought of, and you you raised it very well in your book, is the whole. Um, uh, and you did touch on your presentation, the whole issue of gravity and zero gravity. We've, we've studied, you know, zero gravity, but it's, I think to paraphrase you, as soon as you can get out of zero gravity, they're better because it's just toxic for living right. off, living in. Right. Uh, it's almost like living underwater. I mean, we don't, we didn't go to the new worlds, you know, by creating some type of, artificial lungs so we could survive underwater. <laughs> we just tried to get across these oceans as quickly as possible. And I think that's the only way we can do this in space. There's, there's such a focus on zero gravity research on health as if our future in space depended on it. But our future in space is gonna be with artificial gravity. And it, it's just bizarre to me. I approached, of course, this book, I, I'm primarily a health writer. So that's why I tried to bring in these, these health ideas. Um, and NASA, for the longest time, wasn't so much concerned with health. It didn't really have any doctors on, on its staff, to tell you the truth. Um, yeah, so I, I don't see the purpose of trying to learn how we can live better in zero gravity. At best, it's going to be for workers who are going to have to build things in space. And now we know occupational limits. Mm. Six months is probably the, you know, the longest you're going to want to go. Sure. I'm off. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Julian. Okay. Um, How's everyone feel? Had everyone had about uh, about ready to call it an evening? My my email is wanchek at gmail, so anyone's welcome to send me questions that way. Fantastic, appreciate that, Chris. Well, listen, thank you once again. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time and presenting. It's fascinating. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, we'll have to have that beer one day, right, Chris? We'll have to do that somewhere when we can start moving around the planet again. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thank you. Mike Good and Ashley and the people organising the back end of everything tonight. Congratulations, Steve. And uh, once again, space, uh, the space show on Southern FM on Wednesday night, 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, get your dialing fingers ready and you might be able to win a copy on that as well. So... Uh, with that, I'm going to say goodnight. Thank you, everyone. Chris.